Chapter One of the Home Life of Poe. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Chufi Galeazzi, Rohnert Park, California. The Home Life of Poe by Susan Archer Weiss. Chapter One First Glimpse of Edgar Poe it may be regarded as a somewhat curious coincidence that the first glimpse afforded us of edgar poe is on the authority of my own mother this is the story as she told it to me in the summer of eighteen eleven there was a fine company of players in norfolk and we children were as a special treat taken to see them i remember the names of mr placide mr green mr young and mr poe with their wives i can recall mrs young as a large fair woman with golden hair but my most distinct recollection is of mrs poe she was rather small with a round rosy laughing face short dark curls and beautiful large blue eyes her manner was gay and saucy and the audience was continually applauding her she appeared to me a young girl but was past thirty and had been twice married at this time continued my mother we were living on main street and my uncle dr robert butt of the house of burgesses lived close by on bermuda street the large bright garret room of his house was used by our little cousins as a playroom and was separated from that of the adjoining house by only a wooden partition one day when we were playing here we heard voices on the other side of the partition and peeping through a small knot-hole saw two pretty children with whom we soon made acquaintance mr and mrs poe had taken lodgings in this garret with a little boy and girl and an old welsh nurse sometimes this woman would say to us hush hush dumplings don't make a noise and we knew that someone was sick in that room most of the time she had the children out of doors and in the evenings we would play with them on the sidewalk the boy was a merry romping little fellow but hard to manage one day when he would persist in playing in the middle of the street a runaway horse came dashing around a corner and i remember how the nurse rushed toward him screaming ho hedger hedger snatching him away at the risk of her own life the nurse was a very nice old woman plump rosy and good-natured she wore a huge white cap with flaring frills and pronounced her words in a way that amused us she was devoted to the children who were spoiled and wilful the little girl was running all about and the boy appeared about three years old of this old lady it may be here said that she was really the mother of mrs poe whom she called betty as an actress of the name of arnold she had played in various companies in both this country and europe taking parts in which comic songs were sung her pretty daughter elizabeth she had brought up to her own profession and had married her early to an actor named hopkins who died in october eighteen o five two months after his death his widow married david poe who was at that time a member of their company and meanwhile her mother mrs arnold had bestowed her own hand upon a musician of the romantic name of tubbs who soon left her a widow thenceforth she devoted herself to her daughter's family remaining with the company and occasionally appearing in some unimportant part when in the summer of that year of eighteen fourteen mr placide's company left norfolk to open a season in richmond mr david poe was too ill with consumption to accompany them and his family remained in norfolk he must undoubtedly have died there for from that time in all the affairs of his family his name is not once mentioned nor is the remotest allusion made to him he was probably buried by the city in one of the obscure suburban cemeteries by his death the widow was left penniless and mr placide to whose company she still belonged and who was anxious to have her services in his richmond campaign sent one of his employees to bring the family to richmond at his own expense a room and board had been engaged for them at the house of a milliner named phipps on main street in the low-lying district between fifteenth and seventeenth streets still known as bird in hand 
this room was not by any means the wretched apartment which it has been described by some of poe's biographers it was not a cellar not even a basement room but one back of the shop the family residing above and must have been comfortably furnished for this neighbourhood was at this time the shopping district of the ladies of richmond and mrs phipps was probably a fashionable shopkeeper damp mrs poe's room must have been since this locality was the lowest point in the city where when the river overflowed its banks as was frequently the case the water would rise to the back doors of the main street buildings and at times flood the ground floors in this room mrs poe contracted the malarial fever then known as ague and fever which proved fatal to her owing to her illness mrs poe though her appearance was constantly advertised did not appear on the stage more than half a dozen times if as often mr placide wrote to her husband's relatives in baltimore in behalf of herself and children but received no satisfactory answer and the company kindly gave her a benefit performance also one of the richmond papers the inquirer of november twenty fifth made an appeal to the kind-hearted of the city in behalf of the sick actress and her little children this brought to their aid among others mr john allen and his friend mr mackenzie both these gentlemen were engaged in the tobacco business and being of scotch nationality the feeling of clanship led them to take a special interest in this family whom they discovered to be of good scotch stock everything possible was done for their comfort and mrs allen herself came to minister to the sick woman on her first visit she found mrs tubbs feeding the children with bread soaked in sweetened gin and water which she called gin tea and explained that it was her custom in order to make them strong and healthy this was little edgar's initiation into the habit which became the bane and ruin of his life it soon became evident that mrs poe was very near her end pneumonia set in and on the eighth of december eighteen eleven she died the question now was what was to be done with the children after a consultation among all parties it was agreed that mr mackenzie and mr allen should take charge of them at their own homes until they should be claimed by their baltimore relatives it was a sad scene when the little ones were lifted up to look their last upon the face of their dead mother and then to be separated forever from the grandmother who had so loved and cared for them in parting she gave to each a memento of their mother to the boy a small watercolor portrait of the latter inscribed for my dear little son edgar from his mother and to the girl a jewel case the contents of which had long since been disposed of it was all that she had to leave them and with this slender inheritance in their hands the little waifs were taken away to the homes of strangers on the day following a small funeral procession wended its way up the steep ascent of church hill to the graveyard of st john's church crowning its summit at that day it was no easy matter to get one whose profession had been that of an actor buried in consecrated ground yet mr mackenzie succeeded in effecting this the grave was in a then obscure part of the cemetery close against the eastern wall and here after the brief service the mother of edgar poe was laid to rest mrs tubbs remained with mr placide's company and doubtless returned with them to england and to her own family six weeks after the death of mrs poe occurred that awful tragedy and holocaust of the burning of the richmond theatre which shrouded the whole country in gloom on that night a large and fashionable audience attended the performance of the bleeding nun eighty of whom perished in the flames mrs allen had expressed a wish to attend with her sister and little edgar but her husband objected and instead took them on a christmas visit to the country so they escaped the tragedy as did also the members of placide's company End of chapter one Chapter Two of the Home Life of Poe by Susan Archer Weiss. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Poe's First Home. 
mr and mrs mackenzie on taking charge of the poe children entered into a correspondence with their grandfather mr david poe of baltimore in regard to them he was by no means anxious to claim them he represented that he and his wife were old and poor and that already having the eldest child william henry upon his hands he could not afford to burden himself with the others finally he proposed that the children should be placed in an orphan asylum where they would be properly cared for on hearing of which mrs mackenzie declared that she would never turn the baby rosalie out of her home but would bring her up with her own children while mrs allen who was childless and had become much attached to edgar proposed to her husband to adopt him mr allen demurred his chief objection was that the boy was the child of actors and that to have him brought up as his son would not be advisable for him or creditable to themselves it required some special pleading on the part of the lady and she so far prevailed as that her husband consented to keep and care for the boy as for a son but refused to be bound by any terms of legal responsibility as either guardian or adoptive parent preferring to remain free to act in the future as he might think proper mr mackenzie pursued the same course with regard to rosalie though each bestowed on his protege his own family name in baptism there has been much useless discussion among poe's biographers in regard to the ages of the children at this time woodbury calculates according to certain data obtained from a boston newspaper regarding the appearance of mrs poe on the stage at this time he says speaking of her prolonged absence in eighteen o seven william henry may have been born and accordingly fixes edgar's birth as having occurred two years later in eighteen o nine wishing to satisfy myself on this point i some time since decided to go to the fountain-head for information and wrote to mrs bird a daughter of mrs mackenzie who had been brought up with rosalie poe her answer i have carefully preserved and here give verbatim dear s you ask the ages of rose and edgar he was born in eighteen o eight rose in eighteen ten a remark of his in answer to an invitation to her wedding was that if i had put off my marriage one week it would have been on his birthday i was married on the fifth of october their mother died on the eighth december eighteen eleven and on the ninth the children were taken to mr allen's and our house their mother was boarding at mrs phipps a milliner on main street she was scotch and of good family and my father and mr allen had her put away decently at the old church on the hill mr poe died first this account of the children's ages is entitled to more weight than those of his biographers based upon mere calculations and probabilities when the children were baptized as edgar allen and rosalie mackenzie their ages were also recorded though whether in church or family records is not known and it is not likely that mrs bird who was brought up with rosalie poe could be mistaken on this point were woodbury correct in assuming that william henry the eldest child may have been born in october eighteen o seven and edgar july nineteenth eighteen o nine it would follow that the latter when taken charge of by the allens in december eighteen eleven was less than two years old an impossibility considering that his sister was then over one year old and running about playing with other children as to mr poe's claim to october twelfth as his birthday it is not likely that howsoever often he may have given a false date to others he would have ventured upon it to the daughter of mrs mackenzie the latter of whom would have detected the error it must be accepted as a final conclusion that as mrs bird states edgar was born in eighteen o eight and rosalie in eighteen ten her positive assertion is proof sufficient against all mere calculation and conjecture and in this book i shall hold to these dates as authentic End of chapter two chapter three of the home life of poe by susan archer weiss this librivox recording is in the public domain the allen home 
mr allen was at this time thirty-one years of age a plain practical business man or as someone has described him an honest hard-headed scotchman kindly but stubborn and irascible his wife some years younger than himself was a beautiful woman warm-hearted impulsive and fond of company and amusement both were charitable and though not at this time in what is called society were in comfortable circumstances and fond of entertaining their friends there was yet another member of the family miss anne valentine an elder sister of mrs allen a lady of lovely disposition and almost as fond of edgar as was his so-called mother she was always his aunt nancy the allens were at this time living in the business part of the town occupying one of a row of dingy three-story brick houses still standing on fourteenth street between maine and franklin mr allen had his store on the ground floor the family apartments being above this was at that time and until long afterward a usual mode of living with some of the downtown merchants though a few had already built handsome residences on shaco hill little edgar bright gay and beautiful soon became the pet and pride of the household even mr allen grew fond of him and his wife delighted in taking him about and showing him off among her acquaintances in his baggy little trousers of yellow nankin or silk pongee with his dark ringlets flowing over an immense tucker red silk stockings and peaked purple velvet cap with its heavy gold tassel falling gracefully on one shoulder he was the admiration of all beholders his disposition was affectionate and his temper sweet though having been hitherto allowed to have his own way he was self-willed and sometimes difficult to manage to correct his faults and as a counterbalance to his wife's undue indulgence mr allen conscientiously set about training the boy according to his own ideas of what was best when edgar was good he was petted and indulged but an act of disobedience or wrong-doing was punished as some said with undue severity to shield him from this was the aim of the family even of the servants and the boy soon learned to resort to various little tricks and artifices on his own account an amusing instance of this was told by mrs allen herself edgar one day would persist in running out in the rain when mr allen peremptorily called him in with the threat of a whipping he presently entered and meekly walking up to his guardian looked him in the face with his large solemn gray eyes and held out a bunch of switches what are these for inquired the latter to whip me with answered the little diplomat and mr allen had to turn aside to hide a smile for the switches had been selected with a purpose being only the long tough leaf stems of the ailanthus tree another anecdote i recall illustrative of the strict discipline to which edgar was subject my uncle mr edward valentine who was a cousin of mrs allen and often a visitor at her house was very fond of edgar and liking fun almost as much as did the child taught him many amusing little tricks one of these was to snatch away a chair from some big boy about to seat himself but edgar too young to discriminate on one occasion made a portly and dignified old lady the subject of this performance mr allen who in his anger was always impulsive immediately led away the culprit and his wife took the earliest opportunity of going to console her pet as the child was little over three years old it may be doubted whether the punishment administered was the wisest course but it was mr allen's way who apparently believed in the moral suasion of the rod edgar had no dogs and no pony and did not ride out with a groom to attend him like a little prince as a biographer has represented at this time the allen circumstances were not such as to admit of such luxuries as to his appearance in this style at the famous white sulphur springs that is equally mythical there was however at least one summer when edgar was six years of age in which the allens were at one of the lesser virginia springs and in returning paid a visit to mr valentine's family near staunton this gentleman often took edgar out with him either driving or seated behind him on horseback 
and on receiving his paper from the country post office would make the boy read the news to the mountain rustics who regarded him as a prodigy of learning thus far he had been taught by an old scotch dame who kept an infant school and who then and for years afterward called him her ain wee laddie and to whom as long as she lived he was accustomed to carry offerings of choice smoking tobacco he also learned from her to speak in the broad scottish dialect which greatly amused and pleased mr allen the boy was even at this age remarkably quick in learning anything mr valentine also delighted in getting up wrestling matches between edgar and the little pickaninnies with whom he played rewarding the victor with gifts of money but there was one thing which no money or other reward could induce the boy to undertake and this was to go near the country churchyard after sunset even in company with these same little darkies once in riding home late edgar being seated behind mr valentine they passed a deserted log cabin near which were several graves when the boy's nervous terror became so great that he attempted to get in front of his companion who took him on the saddle before him they would run after us and pull me off he said betraying at even this early age the weird imagination of his maturer years this incident led to his being questioned when it was discovered that he had been accustomed to go with his colored mammy to the servants rooms in the evenings and there listen to the horrible stories of ghosts and graveyard apparitions such as this ignorant and superstitious race delight in it is not improbable that the gruesome sketch of the tempest family one of his earliest published whose ghosts are represented as seated in coffins around a table in an undertaker's shop and thence flying back to their nearby graves was not inspired by some such story heard in mr allen's kitchen undoubtedly these ghostly narratives heard at this early and impressionable age served in part to produce those weird and ghoulish imaginings which characterize some of poe's writings and to create that tinge of superstition which was well known to his friends he always avoided cemeteries hated the sight of coffins and skeletons and would never walk alone at night even on the street believing that evil spirits haunted the darkness and walked beside the lonely wayfarer watching to do him a mischief death he loathed and feared and a corpse he would not look upon and yet as bound by a weird fascination he wrote continually of death edgar poe like every other southern child had his negro mammy to attend to him until he went to england to whom and the other servants he was as much attached as they to him indeed a marked trait of his character was his liking for negroes the effect of early association and to the end of his life he delighted in talking with them and in their quaint and kindly humor and odd modes of thought and expression edgar had been about three years with the allens when he was again deprived of a home and sent among strangers mr allen went on a business trip to england and scotland accompanied by his wife miss valentine and edgar the latter of whom was put to school in london where he must have felt his loneliness and isolation still he came to the allens in holiday times and was with them in scotland for some months previous to their return to virginia little is known of them during this absence of five years End of chapter three chapter four of the home life of poe by susan archer weiss the sleeper vox recording is in the public domain poe's boyhood the allens returned to richmond in june eighteen twenty edgar being then twelve years old having no house ready for their reception they were invited by mr ellis mr allen's business partner to his home on franklin then as now the fashionable street of the city mr allen at once put edgar to professor clark's classical school where he was in intimate association with boys of the best city families at the end of this year the allens removed to a plain cottage-like dwelling at the corner of clay and fifth streets in a quiet and out-of-the-way neighborhood it consisted of but five rooms on the ground floor and a half-story above and here for some years they resided of poe as a schoolboy various accounts have been given by former schoolmates 
with most of whom he was very popular while others represent him as reserved and not generally liked all however agree that he was a remarkably bright pupil with in the higher classes but one rival and that he was high-spirited and the leader in all sorts of fun and frolic mrs mackenzie's eldest son john or jack two years older than edgar though not mentioned by any of poe's biographers was the most intimate and trusted of his lifelong friends the two were playmates in childhood and schoolmates and companions up to the time of poe's departure for the university poe always called mrs mackenzie ma and was almost as much at home in her house as was his sister i remember mr john mackenzie as a portly jolly middle-aged gentleman with a florid face and a hearty laugh this is what he said of poe after the latter's death i never saw in him as boy or man a sign of morbidness or melancholy unless he added it was when mrs stannard died when he appeared for some time grieving and depressed at all other times he was bright and full of fun and high spirits he delighted in playing practical jokes masquerading and making raids on orchards and turnip patches oh yes every schoolboy liked a sweet tender juicy turnip and many a time after the apple crop had been gathered in we might have been seen a half a dozen of us seated on a rail fence like so many crows munching turnips we didn't object to a raw sweet potato at times anything that had the relish of being stolen on saturdays we had fish fries by the river or tramped into the woods for wild grapes and chinkapins it was not always that mr allen would allow edgar to go on these excursions and more than once he would steal off and join us though knowing that he would be punished for it mr allen was a good man in his way added mr mackenzie but edgar was not fond of him he was sharp and exacting and with his long hooked nose and small keen eyes looking from under his shaggy eyebrows always reminded me of a hawk i know that often when angry with edgar he would threaten to turn him adrift and that he never allowed him to lose sight of his dependence on his charity edgar he said was allowed a liberal weekly supply of pocket money but being of a generous disposition and giving treats of taffy and hot gingerbread to his schoolmates at recess besides being generally extravagant this supply was always exhausted before the week was out when he would borrow and so be kept constantly in debt he was however very prompt in paying off his debts mr robert sully nephew of the distinguished artist thomas sully and himself an artist was through life one of poe's firmest friends a boy of delicate physique and a disposition so sensitive and irritable that few could keep on good terms with him he was always in difficulties i was a dull boy at school he said to me and edgar when he knew that i had an unusually hard lesson would help me out with it he would never allow the big boys to tease me and was kind to me in every way i used to admire and in a way envy him he was so bright clever and handsome he lived not far from me just around the corner and one saturday he came running up to our house calling out come along rob we are going to the hermitage woods for chinkapins and you must come too uncle billy is going for a load of pine needles and we can ride in his wagon now that showed his consideration he knowing that i could not walk the long distances that most boys could and therefore seldom went on one of their excursions in one of poe's biographies is an absurd story to the effect that mr clark his first teacher once on detecting him robbing a neighbor's turnip patch tied one of the vegetables about his neck as a token of disgrace which the boy purposely wore home when mr allen in a fury at this insult to his adopted son called on the teacher and threatened him with personal chastisement it is scarcely necessary at this day to deny the truth of that story but the following is what mr clark himself says about it in an interview with a reporter in baltimore some years after poe's death he being at that time nearly eighty years old edgar had a very sweet disposition he was always cheerful brimful of mirth and a very great favorite with his schoolmates i never had occasion to speak a harsh word to him much less to make him do penance 
he had a great ambition to excel he spoke with pride of edgar as a student especially in the classics he and nat howard on one vacation each wrote him a complimentary letter in latin both equally excellent in point of scholarship but edgar's was in verse which nat could not write whenever poe came to baltimore he would not forget to come and see me and i would offer him wine it was the custom you know when he became editor of graham's magazine and could afford it he sent wine to me gratis i think that as boy and man edgar loved me dearly i am sure i loved him yes he was a dear open-hearted cheerful and good boy and as a man he was a loving and affectionate friend to me i went to his funeral the old professor said that poe's sister rosalie he had seen when her brother was a pupil of his she was at that time about ten years old was pretty and a very sweet child poe after leaving professor clark's entered dr burke's classical school in eighteen thirty two where he remained until he went to the university here one of his classmates was dr creed thomas a noted richmond physician who died so late as in eighteen ninety in his reminiscences of poe published in a richmond paper not long before his own death he says poe was one of our brightest pupils he read and scanned the latin poets with ease when scarcely thirteen years of age he was an apt student and always recited well with a great ambition to excel in everything despite his retiring disposition he was never lacking in courage there was not a pluckier boy in school he never provoked a quarrel but would always stand up for his rights it was a noticeable fact that he never asked any of his schoolmates to go home with him after school the boys would frequently on fridays take dinner or spend the night with each other at their homes but poe was never known to enter in this social intercourse after he left the school ground we saw no more of him until next day dr thomas spoke of poe's fondness for the stage he and several other of the brightest boys held amateur theatricals in an old building rented for the purpose poe was one of the best actors but mr allen upon learning of it forbade his having anything to do with these theatricals a great grievance to the boy a singular fact proceeds dr thomas is that poe never got a whipping while at burke's i remember that the boys used to come in for a flogging quite frequently i got my share poe was quiet and dignified during school hours attending strictly to his studies and we all used to wonder at his escaping the rods so successfully he adds that poe was not popular with most of his schoolmates that his manners were retiring and distant doubtless there were boys with whom he did not care to associate feeling the lack of a congeniality between himself and them then there were the prim and priggish class who looked with virtuous disapproval on the robber of apple orchards and turnip patches and who in after years never had a good word to say of poe whether as boy or man it will be observed from dr davis's account that the quiet and dignified manner which distinguished poe in manhood was natural to him even as a boy as regards his never inviting his schoolmates to accompany him home to dinner or to spend the night this would not have been agreeable to edgar who would have preferred having his time to himself for reading or writing his verses a volume of which he now began to make up but he was by no means deprived of company at home the allens as has been said were fond of entertaining their friends and at their sociables and tea-parties edgar was generally required to be present with one or two young friends to keep him company and often he was treated to a party of his own boys and girls where a rigid etiquette was required though dancing and charades were indulged in this was mrs allen's idea of affording him enjoyment and cultivating in him elegant and graceful manners but to him it was most distasteful throughout his life he detested social companies mrs mackenzie in speaking of the social restraint under which the allens at this time sought to keep edgar said that it was very distasteful to the boy who liked to choose his companions and who now at the age of fifteen began to be dissatisfied and to think that he was subject to undue restraint at home 
she often heard him express the wish that he had been adopted by mr mackenzie instead of by mr allen and she would talk to him in her motherly way endeavouring to impress him with a sense of what he owed to the latter his disposition she said was very sweet and affectionate and he was grateful for any kindness and always happy to be at her house as much as he was allowed to be from home her son john could never be persuaded to visit edgar at his home so strict was the etiquette observed at table and in general behaviour she believed that mr allen in taking charge of edgar had been influenced more by a desire to please his wife than any real interest in the child though he had conscientiously endeavoured to do his duty by him she had once heard him say that edgar did not know the meaning of the word gratitude to which she replied that it could not be expected of children who were not able to understand their obligations and that she did not at present look for gratitude from rose but for affection and obedience mrs allen was devoted to edgar and he was very fond of her it was she mrs mackenzie thought rather than her husband who so extravagantly supplied him with money seeming to take a pride in his having more than his schoolmates she was a good and amiable woman fond of pleasure generally and less domestic in her tastes than either her husband or sister mr john mackenzie in speaking of edgar bore witness to his high spirit and pluckiness in occasional schoolboy encounters and also to his timidity in regard to being alone at night and his belief in and fear of the supernatural he had heard poe say when grown that the most horrible thing he could imagine as a boy was to feel an ice-cold hand laid upon his face in a pitch-dark room when alone at night or to awaken in semi-darkness and see an evil face gazing close into his own and that these fancies had so haunted him that he would often keep his head under the bed covering until nearly suffocated the restrictions sought to be placed upon poe's associations and amusements served only to render him more democratic he with two or three of his young friends of congenial tastes were fond of stealing off for a bath in the river near rockets or below the falls in company with the hardy adventurous boys of those localities who were known as river rats it was from them that he learned to swim to row and when the river was low to wade across its rocky bed to the willowy islands and set fish traps when in richmond in after years he told how he had met with some of these former companions and how much he had enjoyed talking with them about old times on the river as regards religious influences and teachings in the allen home it does not appear that edgar was especially subject to these mr and mrs allen were members of st john's episcopal church and punctilious in all church observances and they required of edgar a strict attendance at sunday school and his presence in the family pew during divine service but in those days it was not thought necessary for professed christians to deny themselves social pleasures on sundays luxurious dinners were provided to which friends were invited from church and rides and drives were indulged in edgar was sent to dancing school and mrs allen had her dancing entertainments and her husband his card parties which were attended by some of the most prominent professional men of the city amusements which as is well known exposed episcopalians to the charge of worldliness by other denominations at all these entertainments wine flowed freely i have an impression too vague to be asserted as fact that edgar poe was confirmed at the same time with his sister and mary mackenzie at st john's church and by the clergyman who had baptized them to any inquiry as to his religious denomination he always answered i am an episcopalian but it was often remarked upon by their friends in richmond that neither he nor rosalie had ever been known to manifest a sign of religious feeling or of interest in religious things it was noticeable in both that phrenologically considered the organ of veneration was so undeveloped as to give a depressed or flat appearance to the top of the head when seen in profile and it was known to pose intimate friends that while he believed in a supreme power he had no faith in the doctrine of the divinity of christ hence 
he was as a bark at sea with a guiding star in view but no rudder to direct its course his eager searching for truth was ever but a groping in darkness with now and then a faint far-away ray of the light of truth flashing upon his sight as we see in eureka yet poe was careful to offer no disrespect to religion and he was a frequent attendant at church and a great lover of church music great injustice has been done the allens by poe's biographers in representing them as responsible for his early dissipation by all the story has been repeated of how the child of three or four years was accustomed to be given a glass of wine at dinner parties and required to drink the health of the company it was no unusual thing for little children to be taught this trick for the amusement of company as from my own recollections i can myself aver but the liquor given them was simply a little sweetened wine and water as edgar grew older he was like other boys in his position as the mackenzies allowed his glass of wine at table but no word was ever heard of his being fond of wine until his return from the university i have heard a richmond gentleman who was posed chum at the university speak of the latter's peculiar manner of drinking he was no connoisseur they said in either wine or other liquors and seemed to care little for their mere taste or flavour you never saw him critically discussing his wine or smacking his lips over its excellence but he would generally swallow his glass at a draught as though it had been water especially when he was in any way worried in this way he would soon become intoxicated while his companions remained sober he had the weakest head of any one that i ever knew said this gentleman who attributed his dissipation while at the university not to a natural inclination but to a weakness of will which allowed himself to be easily influenced by his companions hitherto we have seen in poe the schoolboy only what was amiable and lovable but now in his sixteenth year he began to show that beneath this were springs of bitterness which when disturbed could arouse him to a passion and a power hitherto unsuspected i never heard of but one authentic instance of his being subject to slight or snubbing while a boy on account of his parentage or his dependent position in mr allen's family although several writers have taken it for granted that such was the case what effect such treatment would have had upon him is evinced in the instance in question in which a young man a sprig of an aristocratic family chose to object to an association with the son of actors and not only made a point of ignoring him on all occasions but made offensive allusions to him as a charity boy this last being reported to edgar aroused in him a resentment which found expression in a rhyming lampoon upon don pompiosa so brimful of wit sarcasm and keenest ridicule that it was circulated throughout the city for some time though none knew who was the author the young man in question could not make his appearance upon the street without being pointed out and laughed at with audible allusions to don pompiosa and was it was said at length actually driven from the town leaving poe triumphant this was the forerunner of those keen literary onslaughts which in after years made poe as a critic the terror of his enemies End of chapter four chapter five of the home life of poe by susan archer weiss this librivox recording is in the public domain schoolboy love affairs the poe was both as boy and man unusually susceptible to the influence of feminine charms has been the testimony of all who best knew him i never knew the time said mr mackenzie that edgar was not in love with some one nor was it unusual for me when a girl to meet with some comely matron who would laughingly admit that she had been one of edgar poe's sweethearts neither did he confine his boyish gallantries to girls of his own age but admired grown-up belles and young married ladies as well though this was probably in a great measure owing to the playful petting with which they treated the handsome and chivalrous boy-lover 
but this was a trait which did not meet with the approval of miss jane mackenzie sister of the gentleman who adopted rosalie poe this lady noted for her elegant manners and accomplishments kept a fashionable young ladies boarding school patronized by the best families of the state and many a brilliant belle and admired virginia matron boasted of having received her education at miss jane's as i remember her she was tall and stately prim and precise and was attired generally in black silk an elaborate cap and frisette a very lady prioress sort of person she had the reputation of being exceedingly strict in regard to the manners and conduct of her pupils and was a contrast to the rest of her family all of whom were remarkably genial when edgar was about fifteen or sixteen he began to make trouble for miss jane repeatedly she would detect him in secret correspondence with some one of her fair pupils supplemented on his part by offerings of candy and original poetry his sister rosalie being the medium of communication these verses were sometimes compared by the fair recipients and found to be alike with the exception of slight changes appropriate to each a practice which he kept up in after years he possessed some skill in drawing and it was his habit to make pencil sketches of his girl friends with locks of their hair attached to the cards poe himself has told of his boyish devotion to mrs stannard which made so deep an impression upon the mind and heart of the embryo poet the story is well known of how he once accompanied little robert stannard home from school to see his pet pigeons and rabbits and how his heart was won by the gentle and gracious reception given him by the boy's lovely mother and the tenderness of tone and manner with which she talked to him she knowing his pathetic history in his heart a chord of feeling was stirred which had never before been touched and thenceforth he regarded her with a passionate and reverential devotion such as we may imagine the religious devotee to feel for the madonna he calls this the first pure and ideal love of his soul and possibly it may in time have been increased by the knowledge of the doom which hung above and overtook her at the last the partial shrouding of the bright intellect the effect of a hereditary taint indeed it is probable that on this account poe saw very little if anything of mrs stannard in the two succeeding years in which time she led a secluded life with her family dying in april eighteen twenty four at the age of thirty one but the impression had been made and remained with him during his lifetime forming the one solitary ideal which pervaded nearly all his poems the death of the young lovely and beloved this experience was probably the beginning of those occasional dreamy and melancholy moods about this time noticed by some of his companions the living friend of his boyhood's dream became the lost lenore of his maturer years but though poe deeply felt the loss of this beloved friend the story is not to be accepted that he was accustomed to go at night to the cemetery where she was buried and there prostrate on her grave weep away the long hours of cold and darkness no one who knew poe in his boyhood with his horror of cemeteries of darkness and of being alone at night would believe this story first told by poe himself to mrs whitman and by her poetic fancy further embellished besides this is the practical refutation afforded by the high brick wall and locked gates of the cemetery with the strict discipline of the allen home which would have made such midnight excursions impossible another account connected with mrs stannard and repeated by poe's biographers until it has become an article of faith with the public is that the exquisite lines to helen were inspired by an address to that lady if written at ten years of age as poe asserts it will be remembered that he was at this time at school in london and it was not until two years after his return and when he was thirteen years of age that he ever saw mrs stannard he might have altered the lines to suit her his psyche with the pale and classic face and i recall that the folded scroll of the first version was afterward changed to the agate lamp within thy hand as more appropriate to psyche 
poe never made an alteration in his poems that was not an improvement those who knew mrs stannard describe her as slender and graceful with regular delicate features a complexion of marble pallor and dark pensive eyes a portrait of her which was in possession of her son judge robert stannard represented her as a young girl wearing perhaps in respect to her scottish descent a snood in her dark curling hair End of chapter five chapter six of the home life of poe by susan archer weiss this librivox recording is in the public domain rosalie poe of edgar poe's sister rosalie it may be said that all accounts represent her as having been up to the age of ten years a pretty child with blue eyes and rosy cheeks and of a sweet disposition though evincing nothing of edgar's talent and quickness at learning she was yet a rather better pupil than the average and it had been miss mackenzie's intention to give her every advantage of education afforded by her own school so as to fit her for becoming a teacher but when rosalie poe was in her eleventh or twelfth year a strange change came over her for which her friends could never account without having ever been ill a sudden blight seemed to fall upon her as frost upon a flower and she drooped as it were mentally and physically she lost all energy and ambition and thenceforth made little or no progress in her studies growing up into a languid and uninteresting girlhood still she was amiable generous and devoted to her friends who were generally chosen for their personal beauty and for this reason my sister was a great favorite with her to mrs mackenzie she was always dutiful and affectionate but her great pride and affection centered in her brother she felt painfully and would often allude to the difference between them once she said to me of course i can't expect edgar to love me as i do him he is so far above me a peculiarity of miss poe is worth mentioning because it is once shared by her brother and must have been hereditary she could not taste wine without its having an immediate effect upon her she would after venturing to take a glass of wine at dinner sleep for hours and awaken either with a headache or in an irritable and despondent mood as is well known the same effect was produced upon edgar by a moderate indulgence in drink such as would not affect another man and this hereditary weakness should go far in accounting for and excusing those excesses of which all the world is unfortunately aware of the elder brother of edgar william henry i have heard scarcely any mention until after poe's death and few seem to know that there was such a person it seems however that in the summer when edgar was preparing for the university this brother came to richmond on a visit to himself and rose edgar took him around to introduce his young lady acquaintances by one of whom he has been described as handsome gentlemanly and agreeable he died a year or two afterward leaving some poems which show him to have been possessed of unusual poetic talent had he lived he might have rivalled his brother as a poet End of chapter six chapter seven of the home life of poe by susan archer weiss this librivox recording is in the public domain the unrest of youth in the summer of eighteen twenty five mr allen having come into possession of a large fortune left him by an uncle purchased and removed to the handsome brick residence at the corner of main and fifth streets built by mr gallego a wealthy spanish gentleman and which became known as the allen house to own such a residence had long been the desire of mrs allen and upon taking possession of the house she furnished it handsomely and commenced entertaining in a style which rendered them conspicuous in richmond society it was even said that they lived extravagantly and edgar with an abundance of pocket money became the envy of his companions but he was not happy the impatience of restraint of which the mackenzies spoke and the dissatisfaction of which was to him despite its luxuries an uncongenial home rendered him discontented 
the heart of the boy of fifteen began to pulse with the restlessness of the bird when it feels the first nervous twitchings of its wings and his great desire now was to get away from home and enjoy greater freedom he would often when particularly dissatisfied speak to the mackenzies of going to sea or enlisting in the army at present however he contented himself with requesting mr allen to send him to the university mr allen did not see the use of a higher education for one whom he destined for a commercial business but finally yielded and edgar left mr burke's school and under a private tutorage commenced fitting himself for the university this period from june to february fourteenth eighteen twenty five was the only time with the exception of two brief intervals that he resided in the allen house on another point however he did not so easily have his way he was very anxious that his youthful poems be published in book form and importuned mr allen to that effect but this was a thing with which the latter had no sympathy he did consent to go with the boy to hear what mr clark's judgment of the verses would be but finally concluded that edgar was too young to publish a book and so the latter's eager and ambitious hopes were for the time frustrated still this must have been a pleasant summer for him in the enjoyment of his new home with its fine lawn and garden in place of the cramped cottage on clay street and especially in the knowledge that he was breaking away from his schoolboy days and assuming something of the independence of youth it was at this time that he made the famous swim of seven miles on james river from warwick point to richmond which has been so much commented upon showing with what fine athletic powers he was gifted it was on the fourteenth of february eighteen twenty five that poe entered the university inscribing on the matriculation book the date of his birth as january nineteenth eighteen o nine making him sixteen years of age when he was really seventeen born in eighteen o eight this date it will be observed agrees with no other that he has given of his course at the university his biographers have informed us on the authority of professors and students some of whom credit him with almost every vice of dissipation while others defend him from such imputation but when he returned home at the end of the first year with a brilliant scholastic record it became known that mr allen had been called upon to pay his gambling and other debts amounting on the whole to over two thousand dollars mr allen went on to charlottesville to investigate the matter and scrupulously paid all that he considered honest debts refusing to notice the gambling debts poe having paid little attention to his personal affairs was almost as much surprised as was mr allen at the amount of his indebtedness he appeared truly penitent and frankly so expressed himself to mr allen offering to repay the latter by his services in his counting-house it was agreed that after the christmas holidays he should take his place in the office as clerk this was the beginning of the declension of poe's social and personal reputation by his elders he was severely condemned while the good little boys who had formerly looked doubtfully upon the robber of orchards and turnip patches now passed him by with sidelong glances and pursed-up lips and yet good cause though mr allen had to be angry as he was we have the following account of edgar's reception at home when he returned from the university for the christmas holidays a reception for which he was doubtless indebted to his devoted foster-mother a former schoolmate of his charles bowling writes to the editor of a richmond paper that mr allen when on a visit to the country having given him a cordial invitation to call on him when in richmond he one evening near christmas went to his house where he was kindly received after sitting a while he perceived certain signs as of preparation for the entertainment of company and at once rose to leave but his host insisted upon his remaining saying that edgar had just come home from the university and some of his young friends had been invited to meet him bowling replied that he was not in a suitable dress for company when mr allen said go up to edgar's room he will supply you with one of his own suits he found edgar lying on a lounge reading 
who welcomed him cordially and throwing open his wardrobe doors placed the contents at his disposal this was a room which on their removal to their new home mrs allen had chosen for edgar's occupation furnishing it handsomely with his books and pictures arranged in bookcases and on the wall he took great pleasure in this apartment and had always passed much of his time there when the two youths had attired themselves to their satisfaction they repaired to the drawing-room where poe did his duty in welcoming his guests but after a while he took bowling aside and proposed that they should go down the street and have a spree of their own to this the latter very properly objected saying oh no that would never do but being urged finally consented and they stole away from the company together this was an assertion of independence which one year previous he would not have ventured upon but he was now no longer a schoolboy but a university student and as he claimed nearly eighteen years of age this past year had wrought a great change in him and he was already in his heart prepared to break away from the restraint and authority which he had found so irksome and assert his independence in due time poe was installed in mr allen's counting-house as clerk but had occupied that position but a short time when it became intolerable to him he begged mr allen to give him some other employment saying that he would rather earn his living in any other way mr allen still angry about the university debts told him that he was his own master and could choose what employment he pleased but that henceforth he was not to look to him for assistance after an angry scene between the two poe packed his travelling bag and leaving the allen house did not return to it for the space of two years it will be observed that this was no runaway act on poe's part as asserted by biographers he took an affectionate leave of mrs allen and miss valentine who supplied him with money and neither of whom believed but that he would be back in a few weeks he went to take leave of the mackenzies who all but his friend jack advised him to return and submit himself to mr allen but this he would not could not do he claimed that mr allen had spoken insultingly to him and declared that he would no longer be dependent on him and so he went forth as he said to seek his fortune he made his way to boston where the first use to which he put his money was in publishing a cheap edition of his poems they were not of a kind to attract attention and he never realized a dollar from them ambitious to have them known he sent a number to his friends in richmond and other places south and the rest turned over to his publisher an obscure young man of the name of thomas in part payment of the expense of publishing then followed a season of wandering in search of employment until his money all gone he had no resource but to enlist in the army which he did on may second eighteen twenty seven being then as he claimed eighteen really nineteen years of age but representing himself as twenty-two end of chapter seven chapter eight of the home life of poe by susan archer weiss the sleeper vox recording is in the public domain in barracks in the year eighteen twenty nine my uncle dr archer then post-surgeon at fortress monroe was one day called to the hospital to attend a private soldier known as edgar a perry finding him a young man of superior manners and education his interest was aroused and his patient won by his sympathy finally confessed that his real name was edgar a poe and that he was the adopted son of mr john allen of richmond and also expressed an earnest desire to leave the army in which he had now been for two years the term of enlistment being five years dr archer informed the commanding officer of these revelations and as perry alias poe had proven himself in all respects a model soldier interest in his case was at once aroused it was suggested that with his education and the social position which he had enjoyed a cadetship at west point would be more suited to him than the place of a private at fortress monroe poe in his anxiety to be rid of the army was willing enough to accept this proposal and by the advice of his new friends wrote to mr allen informing him of his wishes and asking his assistance 
for some time he received no answer but at length there came a letter which must have caused his heart a pang of real sorrow it was from mr allen informing him of the death of his wife and directing him to apply for a furlough and come on at once to richmond where he arrived two days after her burial woodbury is mistaken in saying that in all this time mr allen had not known of edgar's whereabouts according to miss valentine poe never at any time ceased entirely to correspond with mrs allen who never to her dying day lost her interest in the boy whom she loved as a son and neither ceased her endeavours to reconcile himself and her husband urging edgar to return and mr allen to receive him in anticipation of such result she kept his room as he had left it ready for his occupation at any time that it might suit his wayward fancy to return mr allen talked to poe seriously and finding that his great desire was to get a discharge from the army promised to assist him but only upon condition of his entering west point by which there would be secured to him an honourable and independent position for life and allen himself be relieved from all responsibility concerning him but that he had not entirely forgiven edgar was evident from a letter to the latter's commanding officer wherein he exposes unnecessarily perhaps the youth's gambling habits at the university declaring that he is no relation of mine whatever and no more to me than many others who being in need i have regarded as being my care poe must have felt this latter as a humiliation and it was certainly not calculated to increase his regard for the writer poe's career at west point is well known at first all went well one of his virginia comrades colonel allen magruder describes him as of a simple and kindly nature but by reason of his distance and reserve not popular with the cadets and that he at length confined his association exclusively to virginians but the old discontent and impatience of restraint returned upon him and after some months he wrote to mr allen that he wished to leave west point a step to which the latter positively refused his assistance finding nobody inclined to help him he resolved to force his discharge he purposely neglected his studies and military duties deliberately violated the rules engaged it was said by some in all sorts of disgraceful pranks and finally was tried by court-martial and on may seventh eighteen thirty one dismissed from the institute it has been naturally inferred that poe's object in this voluntary self-sacrifice was simply to free himself from the irksomeness of military duties which on trial he found so opposed to his taste and inclination but perhaps the real motive was one which has never yet been suspected some time after poe's death i was informed by a lady that being in company where the conversation turned upon the poet and his writings one who did not admire the latter remarked that edgar poe could have been of more use to both himself and others by remaining at west point and adopting the army as a profession to this an old army officer captain patrick galt replied that he had been informed by one who had been a classmate of poe that the latter had been driven away from west point by the slights and snubs of the cadets on account of his parentage and his bringing up as an object of charity west point this officer declared had in poe's time been a very hotbed of aristocratic prejudice and pretension and poe's history being known these young aristocrats held themselves aloof while the more snobbish among them probably by reason of his reserve and acknowledged superiority in some respects did not hesitate to attempt to humiliate him on occasion poe he said probably knew that this odium would in a measure attach to him throughout his whole military career and he acted wisely in declining to expose himself to it hence the shyness and reserve of which some of his fellow cadets speak and his exclusive association with virginians who generally stand by each other. End of chapter 8。Chapter 9 of The Home Life of Poe by Susan Archer Weiss。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain。Poe and Mrs. Allen。
in the meantime mr allen had contracted a second marriage the lady being a miss louisa patterson of new jersey she was thirty years of age not handsome but of dignified and courteous manners with large strongly marked features indicative of decision of character and as was said a will of her own nevertheless she was amiably inclined and as a society leader very tactful and diplomatic one marked characteristic of hers was that she never forgave the least slight or disrespect to herself though the offender were but a child and of this i remember some curious instances in my own acquaintance with her many years after the time of which i speak it does not appear how poe received the news of this marriage but one thing seems certain that strangely enough the idea never occurred to him that it in any way affected his own position in mr allen's house he had never received from the latter any word to that effect miss valentine his aunt nancy with the old servants who had known and served and loved him from his babyhood were still there and doubtless his room was still being kept as ever before ready for his occupation it was therefore with perfect confidence that upon being dismissed from west point he proceeded to richmond having barely enough money to pay his way and sounding the brazen knocker of mr allen's door greeted the old servant pleasantly handing him his travelling bag to be carried to his room at the same time asking for miss valentine the answer of the servant astonished him his old room had been taken by mrs allen as a guest chamber and his personal effects removed to the end room this was the last of several small apartments opening upon a narrow corridor extending on one side of the house above the kitchen and the servants apartments it had at one time been occupied by mrs allen's maid on receiving this information poe was extremely indignant and refusing to have his carpet-bag carried to that room requested to see mrs allen the lady came down to the parlor in all her dignity and answered to his inquiry that she had arranged her house to suit herself that she had not been informed that mr poe had any present claim to that room or that he was expected again to occupy it warm words ensued and she reminded him that he was a pensioner on her husband's charity which provoked him to more than hint that she had married mr allen for mercenary motives this was enough for the lady she sent for her husband who was at his place of business and who upon hearing her account of the interview coupled with the assertion that edgar poe and herself could not remain a day under the same roof without seeing poe sent to him an imperative order to leave the house at once which he immediately did it was told by himself that as he crossed the hall mr allen hastily entered it from a side door and called harshly to him at the same time drawing out his purse but that he without pause or notice continued on his way this account of the rupture between poe and the allens i heard from the mackenzies and mrs julia mayo cabell wife of poe's schoolboy friend dr robert g cabell to whom poe himself related it the friends of the allens gave a much more sensational account of the affair which was much discussed and went the rounds of the city with such additions and exaggerations as gossip could invent until it culminated at length in the dark picture with which griswold horrified the world it was to this incident that poe alluded when he told mrs whitman that his pride had led him to deliberately throw away a large fortune rather than submit to a trivial wrong. End of chapter 9。Chapter 10 of The Home Life of Poe by Susan Archer Weiss. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Closing of the Gate when poe after leaving mr allen's door crossed the lawn and passed out of the gate can any one realize how momentous was the instant of time in which the gate closed after him or what a woeful human tragedy was in that instant inaugurated the closing of the gate meant the shutting out forever of his past life 
the clang of the iron latch was the knell of all that had been bright and pleasant and prosperous in that life now lost to him for ever there he stood homeless penniless friendless utterly alone in the world with a pathless future before him shadowy dim no hand to point him onward and no star to guide him from this moment commences the true history of edgar a poe on leaving the allen house poe went directly to the mackenzies the only place to which he could turn and spent several days with these kind friends discussing what would be best for him to do now that he had his own way to make in the world they advised him to begin by teaching until he could see his way more clearly but richmond was at present no place for him and he decided to go to baltimore where his relatives knowing the city so well might be able to assist him the mackenzies gave him what money they could spare and miss valentine on hearing where he was sent more but in baltimore poe found himself coldly received by his relatives since his miserable failure at west point when his prospects had seemed so bright and all conspiring for his good they had lost all faith in him and did not propose to trouble themselves on his account on his last visit nielsen poe at whose house he was staying had obtained for him a place in an editor's office which after a brief trial poe threw up he now again applied for that place but failed as also in his application for the position of assistant teacher in some academy and now commenced that wretched life of wandering and penury and according to mr kennedy of actual starvation which is as sad as any other such history in literature with the exception of that poor chatterton his days were passed in roaming about the streets in search of employment anything by which he could obtain food and at night a miserable place where to rest his weary limbs he wrote a few stories which he endeavoured to dispose of to editors but met with no success many stories have been told in regard to this unhappy period of poe's life one related by a richmond man stated that being in baltimore about the time in question he one day had occasion to visit a brickyard when there passed him by a line of men bearing the freshly moulded bricks to the kiln glancing at them casually he was amazed to recognize among them edgar poe he could not be mistaken having been for years familiar with his appearance whether poe recognized him he could not say but when he returned next day he was not there nor did any one know of the name of poe among the laborers it was the opinion of this man that he had merely picked up a day's job for a day's need he was said to have been recognized in other equally uncongenial occupations but relief was at hand in the time of his sorest need End of chapter ten chapter eleven of the home life of poe by susan archer weiss this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mrs. Clem His father's sister, Mrs. Maria Clem, who had for some years been living in a New York country town, supporting herself and little daughter by dressmaking, about this time returned to Baltimore, and hearing from the pose of the presence of her brother's son in the city, commenced a search for him. She found him at length ill, really ill and at once took him to her own humble home installing him in a room which had been furnished for a lodger and from that hour attended and cared for him with a true motherly devotion those who believe in the spirit of the old adage blood is thicker than water may imagine what a blessed relief this was to the weary and almost despairing wanderer here he had what he needed almost as much as he did food rest rest for the weak and exhausted body and for the anxious mind as well here in the quiet little room he could lie and dream in the blissful consciousness that near him were the watchful eyes and careful hands of his own father's sister ready to attend to his slightest want and from the day on which he first entered her humble abode poe was never more to be a homeless wanderer to him it proved ever a safe little harbor 
a sure haven of refuge and repose in all storms and troubles that assailed even to his life's end mrs clem was at this time a strong vigorous woman somewhat past middle age and of large frame and masculine features her manner was dignified and well-bred and she was possessed of abundant self-reliance ready resource and as must be said of clever artifice as well where artifice was necessary to the accomplishment of a purpose her abode though plainly and cheaply furnished was a picture of neatness and such comfort as she could afford to give it but her means were only what could be derived from dressmaking taking a lodger or two and at times teaching a few small children this state of affairs dawned upon poe as he slowly recovered from his fever dreams and he again became aware of the strong necessity of further exertion on his part mrs clem would not allow him to go to a hospital probably she feared to lose him in some degree isolated from her other kindred she had in her loneliness found a son and the pertinacity with which she thenceforth clung to him was something remarkable poe soon resumed his weary search for employment but for some time without success in his hours of enforced idleness at home he found employment in teaching his little cousin virginia a pretty and affectionate child of ten years who however was fonder of a walk or romp with him than of her lessons she was devoted to her handsome cousin and having hitherto lived with her mother and with few or no playmates or companions soon learned to depend upon him for all pleasure or amusement they called each other both then and ever after buddy and sissy while mrs clem was muddy to both of this period of poe's life in baltimore dr snodgrass a literary bohemian of the time has given us glimpses in baltimore his chief resort was the widow meagre's place an inexpensive but respectable eating-house with a bar attached and a room where the customers could indulge in a smoke or a social game of cards this was frequented chiefly by printers and employees of shipping offices poe was a great favorite with the widow meagre a kindly old irish woman on entering there you would generally find him seated behind her oyster counter at which she presided himself as silent as an oyster grave and retiring knowing him to be a poet she addressed him always by the old irish title of bard and by this name he was here known it was bard have a nip bard take a hand whenever anything particularly pleased the old woman's fancy she would request poe to put it in poetry and i have seen many of these little pieces which appear to me more worthy of preservation than some included in his published works it happened that poe one evening in his wanderings about the streets stopped to read a copy of the evening visitor exposed for sale and had his attention attracted by the offer of a purse of one hundred dollars for the best original story to be submitted to that journal anonymously remembering his rejected manuscripts he at once hastened home and making them into a neat parcel dispatched them to the office of the visitor though with little or no hope of their meeting with acceptance his feelings may therefore be imagined when he shortly received a letter informing him that the prize of one hundred dollars had been awarded to his story of the gold bug and desiring him to come to the office of the visitor and receive the money it was on this occasion that poe made the acquaintance of mr j p kennedy author of swallow barn who proved such a true friend to him in time of need mr kennedy says he recognized in the thin pale shabbily dressed but neatly groomed young man a gentleman and also that he was starving he invited him frequently to his table presented him with a suit of clothes and seeing how feeble he was gave him the use of a horse for the exercise which he so much needed he also obtained for him some employment in the office of the evening visitor whose editor mr wilmer accepted several stories from his pen and it was now evidently that poe decided upon literature as a profession under these favoring conditions poe rapidly recovered his health and spirits mr wilmer who saw a good deal of him at this time says that when their office work was done they would often walk out together into the suburbs generally accompanied by virginia who would never be left behind 
at the office he was punctual industrious and his work satisfactory in all his association with him he never saw him under the influence of intoxicants or knew him to drink except once moderately when he opened a bottle of wine for a visitor i once clipped from a baltimore paper the following article by a reporter to whom the story was related by a lively and comely old lady herself its heroine i give it as an illustration of the easy confidence with which poe even in his youth sought the acquaintance of women who attracted his attention End of chapter eleven Chapter Twelve of the Home Life of Poe by Susan Archer Weiss. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A pretty girl with auburn hair whom Poe loved. The old lady commenced by saying that she had known Poe quite intimately when she and her mother were residents of Baltimore, about eighteen thirty two. She was then seventeen years of age and attending a finishing school in that city she confided to me laughingly that she was considered a very pretty girl with dark eyes and curling auburn hair the first time she noticed poe she said was once when she was studying her lesson in the window of her room which was in the rear of the house looking up she saw a very handsome young man standing in an opposite back window on the next street looking directly at her she pretended to take no notice but on the following evening the same thing occurred he appeared to be writing at his window and each time that he laid aside a sheet he would look over at her and at length bowed this time a school friend was with her who in a spirit of fun returned the bow that evening as the two were seated on the veranda together this young man sauntered past and deliberately ascending the steps of the adjoining house spoke to them addressing them by name he sat for some time on the dividing rail of the two verandas making himself very agreeable and the acquaintance thus commenced in a mere spirit of schoolgirl fun was kept up for several weeks some story being invented to satisfy the mother of course it was all wrong said the old lady but it was fun nevertheless and we girls could see no harm in it but one evening when mr poe and myself had been strolling up and down in the moonlight until quite late my mother desired him not to come again as i was only a schoolgirl and the neighbors would talk so our acquaintance ended abruptly she added that although they never again met she always felt the deepest interest in hearing of him and had never forgotten her fascinating boy lover asked if she had ever seen virginia she replied yes several times when she was with her cousin that she was a pretty child but her chalky white complexion spoiled her mr allen died in march eighteen thirty four leaving three fine little boys to inherit his fortune some time before his death an absurd story was circulated which we find related in the richmond standard of april eighteen eighty one thirty-one years after poe's death on the authority of mr t h ellis of richmond it appears that a friend of poe wrote to the latter that mr allen had spoken kindly of him seeming to regret his harshness and advising him to come on to richmond and call on him in his illness acting upon this advice he one evening in february presented himself at mr allen's door the rest as told by ellis is as follows he was met at the door by mrs allen who not recognizing him said that her husband had been forbidden by his physician to see visitors thrusting her rudely aside he rapidly made his way upstairs and into the chamber where mr allen sat in an armchair who on seeing him raised his cane threatening to strike him if he approached nearer and ordered him to leave the house which he did woodbury asserts the truth of this story because as he says mr ellis had the very best means of knowing the truth but ellis was at this time only a youth of eighteen or twenty and had no more opportunity of knowing the truth than the numerous acquaintances of the allens to whom they related their version of the incident with never a mention of the cane poe they said accused the servant of having delivered his message to mrs allen and creating some disturbance the latter called to the servant to drive that drunken man away 
mr ellis should have remembered that mrs allen to the day of her death asserted that she had never but once seen poe consequently this story of the second meeting between them and of poe's rudely thrusting her aside and being threatened with the cane is simply a specimen of the gossip which was continually being circulated concerning poe by his enemies End of chapter twelve chapter thirteen of the home life of poe by susan archer weiss this librivox recording is in the public domain poe's double marriage how it was that poe when a mature man of twenty-seven came to marry his little cousin of twelve or thirteen has ever appeared something of a mystery as understood by his richmond friends it appeared that when in july of eighteen thirty five he left baltimore to assume the duties of assistant editor to mr white of the southern literary messenger virginia deprived of her constant companion so missed him and grieved over his absence that her mother became alarmed for her health and wrote to poe concerning it and that in may of the following year the two came to richmond where poe and virginia were married she being at that time not fourteen years of age for this marriage mrs clem was severely criticized the universal belief being that she had made the match of any other marriage than this these friends never heard since it was only from a letter found among poe's papers after his death and the reluctant admission of mrs clem that it became known that a previous marriage had taken place the marriage records of baltimore show that on september twenty second eighteen thirty five edgar a poe took out a license to marry virginia e clem mrs clem when interviewed by one of poe's biographers admitted there had been such a marriage and stated that the ceremony had been performed by bishop john johns in old christ church though of this there is no mention in the church records immediately after the ceremony she said poe returned to richmond and to his editorial duties on the messenger she vouchsafed no explanation except that the two were engaged previous to poe's departure for richmond a possible explanation of the mystery may be that mrs clem having set her heart upon keeping her nephew in the family could think of no surer means than that of a match between himself and her daughter when he left baltimore for richmond in july she doubtless had her fears and then came reports of his notorious love affairs one of which came near ending in an elopement and marriage it was probably then that she wrote to him about virginia's grieving for him following up this letter with another saying that nielsen poe had offered to take virginia into his family and care for her until she should be eighteen years of age this brought a prompt reply from poe begging that she would not consent to this plan and take sissy away from him this last letter is dated august twenty ninth what other correspondence followed we do not know but two weeks later on september eleventh eighteen thirty five we find poe writing to his friend mr kennedy the following extraordinary letter in which he clearly hints at suicide i am wretched i know not why console me for you can but let it be quickly or it will be too late convince me that it is worth one's while to live oh pity me for i feel that my words are incoherent urge me to do what is right fail not as you value your peace of mind hereafter edgar a poe this production which in whatever light it is viewed cannot but be regarded as an evidence of pitiable weakness some writer has chosen to attribute poe's anguish to the prospect of losing virginia but it does not at all appear that such is the case for even if nielsen poe did make such an offer poe knew well enough that neither mrs clem nor her daughter would ever consent to accept it the whole thing appears to have been simply a plan of mrs clem to bring matters to the satisfactory conclusion which she desired she possessed over her nephew then and always the influence and authority of a strong and determined will over a very weak one and we see here that in less than two months after poe's leaving her house she had carried her point and married him to her daughter 
having thus secured him she was content to wait a more propitious time for making the marriage public there is yet a little episode which may have influenced this affair and may serve further to explain it when poe first went to richmond mr white as a safeguard from the temptation to evil habits received him as an inmate of his own home where he immediately fell in love with the editor's youngest daughter little eliza a lovely girl of eighteen it was said that the father who idolized his daughter and was also very fond of poe did not forbid the match but made his consent conditional upon the young man's remaining perfectly sober for a certain length of time all was going well and the couple were looked upon as engaged when mrs clem who kept a watchful eye upon her nephew may have received information of the affair and we have seen the result does this throw any light upon poe's pitiful appeal urge me to do what is right was this why the marriage was kept secret to give time for a proper breaking off of the match with elizabeth white and it is certain from all accounts that poe now at once plunged into the dissipation which was according to the general report the occasion of mr white's prohibition of his attentions to his daughter it was she to whom the lines to eliza now included in poe's poems were addressed when i was a girl i more than once heard of eliza white and her love affair with edgar poe she was the sweetest girl that i ever knew said a lady who had been her schoolmate a slender graceful blonde with deep blue eyes who reminded you of the watteau shepherdesses upon fans she was a great student and very bright and intelligent she was said to be engaged to poe but they never appeared anywhere together it was soon broken off on account of his dissipation i don't think she ever got over it she had many admirers but is still unmarried recently i read an article written by mrs holmes cumming of louisville kentucky in which she spoke of persons and places that she had seen in richmond associated with poe among others she met with a niece of eliza white who when a child had often seen poe at the latter's home she remembered having at a party seen him dancing with eliza and how everyone remarked what a handsome couple they were she had never seen anyone enjoy dancing more than poe did not but that he was very dignified but you could see in his whole manner and expression how he enjoyed it perhaps it was because he had little eliza for a partner previous to poe's first marriage he had boarded with a mrs poor on bank street facing the capitol square and with whose son-in-law mr thomas w cleland he held friendly relations a few weeks after his first marriage which was still kept secret he removed to the establishment of a mrs yarrington in the same neighborhood where being joined by mrs clem and virginia they lived together as formerly he as he informed mr george poe paying out of his slender salary nine dollars a week for their joint board this continued until may of the next year when the public marriage of poe in virginia took place on this occasion mr thomas cleland was obliging enough to consent to act as poe's surety and he also secured the services of his own pastor the rev amasa converse a noted presbyterian minister late on the evening of may sixteenth mr cleland with mrs clem poe and virginia left mrs yarrington's and walking quietly up main street to the corner of seventh were married in mr converse's own parlor and in the presence of his family mrs clem giving her full and free consent the clergyman remarked afterward that mrs clem struck him as being polished dignified and agreeable in her bearing while the bride looked very young the party then returned to their boarding-house where mrs clem invited the lady boarders to her room to partake of wine and cake when it was discovered that it was a wedding celebration it will be observed that according to the marriage bond virginia was married under her maiden name of clem thus ignoring the former ceremony and that poe subscribed to the oath of thomas cleland that she was of the full age of twenty-one years when in reality she was but thirteen 
having been born august sixteenth eighteen twenty two thus is shown how pliable was poe in the hands of his mother-in-law and as regards mr cleland who was a very pious presbyterian it can only be hoped that he never discovered in what manner he had been imposed upon End of chapter thirteen the home life of poe by susan archer weiss this LibriVox recording is in the public domain the poe's in richmond when poe went to richmond as assistant editor to mr white it had been with the expectation of resuming his old place among his former friends and associates a prospect which as he himself stated in a letter to that gentleman had afforded him very great pleasure he had no idea of the altered estimate in which he was held by some of these and of the general prejudice existing against him in consequence of the exaggerated reports concerning his rupture with the allens and the later story of his attempt to force himself into mr allen's presence it is true that the mackenzies the sullies dr robert g cabell and his wife with some others of the best people remained his firm friends but he found himself without social standing and with but few associates among his former acquaintances it was even said that when a leading society lady enjoying a literary reputation the mother of mrs julia mayo cabell and mrs general winfield scott gave an entertainment to which she invited the talented young editor of the messenger two of the most priggish of these gentlemen declined to attend rather than meet their former schoolmate edgar poe this state of things must undoubtedly have served to irritate and embitter one of poe's proud and sensitive nature and may have partly led to the dissipated habits in which he now for the first time began to indulge besides in some measure influencing the extreme bitterness and severity or as it has been called venom of the criticism for which the messenger began to be noted never before had he been accused of unamiability of disposition but his temper seemed suddenly to have changed and he was called haughty overbearing and quarrelsome a great and it is to be feared irreparable obloquy has attached to poe's name through the utterance of a single individual a mr ferguson who was employed as a printer's assistant in the office of the messenger at the time of poe's editorship of that magazine not many years ago mr ferguson who is still living said in answer to some inquiry concerning the poet there never was a more perfect gentleman than mr poe when he was sober but that at other times he would just as soon lie down in the gutter as anywhere else and this assertion has been taken up by one and another writer until it appears now to be received as a fixed fact i have often heard this statement indignantly denied by persons who knew poe at this time howsoever much under the influence of drink he might be he was they say never at any time or by any person seen staggering through the streets or lying in a gutter on the contrary he was extremely sensitive about being seen by his friends and especially ladies under the influence of drink poe himself long after this time while denying the charge of general dissipation confessed that while in richmond he at long intervals yielded to temptation and after each excess was invariably for some days confined to his bed and now in addition to other charges against him was that of neglecting his wife and being frequently seen in attendance on other women a point on which his motherly friend mrs mackenzie more than once felt herself called upon to remonstrate with him he would be for a week at a time away from his home putting up at various hotels and boarding-houses and spending his money freely instead of as formerly committing it to the keeping of his mother-in-law mrs clem descending from the dignity of a boarder tried to open a boarding-house of her own but failed and she now rented a cheap tenement on seventh street and went back to her dressmaking letting out rooms and probably taking one or two boarders but it was seldom that her son-in-law was to be found here 
though always after one of his excesses he would seek its seclusion until fit to again appear in public mr hewitt who was about this time in richmond says that he heard a great deal of gossip about poe's love affairs and describes him as at this time of remarkable personal beauty graceful and with dark curling hair and magnificent eyes wearing a byron collar and looking every inch a poet an old gentleman a distinguished lawyer once undertook his defence saying poe is one of the kind whom men envy and calumniate and women adore how many could resist the temptation the mackenzies spoke of virginia at this time now fourteen years of age as being small for her age but very plump pretty but not especially so with sweet and gentle manners and the simplicity of a child rose poe now twenty-six years of age would sometimes take her young sister-in-law to spend an afternoon at the mackenzies where she appeared as much of a child as any of the pupils joining in their sports of swinging and skipping rope on one occasion her husband buddy came unexpectedly to bring her home when she scandalized miss jane mackenzie by rushing into the street and greeting him with the abandon of a child nearly twenty years after this time there were persons living on main street who remembered having almost daily seen about the old market in business hours a tall dignified-looking woman with a market-basket on one arm while on the other hung a little girl with a round ever-smiling face who was addressed as mrs poe she too carried a basket whatsoever was the cause of poe's discontent he never appeared happy or satisfied while in richmond his dissipated habits grew upon him with a consequent neglect of editorial duties which sorely tried the patience of his good and kind friend mr white to whom it must be admitted poe never appeared sufficiently grateful whether mr white was compelled at length to reluctantly discharge him or whether as mr kennedy says poe himself gave up his place as editor of the messenger thinking that with his now established literary reputation he could do better in the north is not clear but in the summer of eighteen thirty eight he left richmond and with his family removed to new york mrs clem at least could not have been averse to the move for it seems certain that there was a general prejudice against her on account of her having made or consented to the match between her little daughter and a man of poe's age and dissipated habits End of chapter fourteen chapter fifteen of the home life of poe by susan archer weiss this librivox recording is in the public domain in new york of poe's business and literary affairs in new york and subsequently in philadelphia his biographers have fully informed us but with little or no mention of his home life or his family all that we can gather concerning the latter is that never at any time were their circumstances such as would enable them to dispense with the utmost economy of living and that as regarded the practical everyday business affairs of life poe was almost as helpless and dependent upon his mother-in-law as was his child wife but for this devoted mother what could they have done those two whom she rightly called her children poe was sadly disappointed in his hopes of obtaining literary employment in new york and but for mrs clem's opening a boarding-house on carmine street an obscure locality the family might have starved here however he seems to have turned over a new leaf for one of the boarders a mr gowans a bookseller on the next street declares that in the eight months of his residence at mrs clem's and a daily intercourse with poe he never saw him otherwise than sober courteous and a perfect gentleman being a stranger in new york he was removed from the temptations which had assailed him in richmond and this fact should be noted as a proof that when left to himself he showed no inclination to indulge in dissipation of virginia poe's wife then fifteen years of age this gallant old bachelor says in the exaggerated style of flattery common in those days 
her eyes outshone those of any houri and her features would defy the genius of a canova to imitate poe delighted in her round childlike face and plump little figure End of chapter 15「The Real Virginia」As regards the nature of Poe's affection for his wife, I have often recalled an expression of Mr. John Mackenzie when, after the poet's death, a group of his friends were familiarly discussing his character. One doubted whether Poe had ever really loved his wife to which mr mackenzie replied i believe that edgar loved his wife but not that he was ever in love with her which accounts for his constancy i have heard other men say that it was impossible that poe at the age of twenty-seven could have felt for the child of twelve with whom he had played and romped in the familiar association of home life and the free intercourse of brother and sister aught of the absorbing and idealizing passion of love at most said they there could have been but the tender and protective affection of an elder brother or cousin which as mr mackenzie remarked was in one of poe's temperament the best guarantee for its continuance apart from the disparity of age there was no congeniality of mind or character to draw these two into sympathy virginia was not mentally gifted and poe once after her death remarked to mrs mackenzie that she had never read half of his poems when writing he would go to mrs clem to explain his ideas or ask her opinion but never to virginia she was his pet his plaything his little sissy whose sunny temper and affectionate disposition brightened and cheered his home she was always a child said a lady who knew her well even in person smaller and younger looking than her real age she retained to the last the shy sweetness and simplicity of childhood it would certainly appear that poe's child wife never attained to the full completeness of the nature and affections of a mature woman she was never known to manifest jealousy of the women whom he so notoriously admired neither did scandals disturb nor his neglect estrange her mrs clem would sometimes as in duty bound take him to task for his irregularities but no word of reproach ever escaped virginia she regarded him with the most implicit and childlike trust and certainly it seems that poe of all men knew how by endearing epithets and eloquent protestations to win a woman's confidence as will presently appear but naturally this was not the kind of affection to satisfy one of poe's impassioned and poetic nature he craved a woman's love and the sympathetic appreciation of talented women in whose companionship as mrs whitman assures us he delighted what he did not find in virginia he sought elsewhere in special he missed in her that understanding and appreciation of his genius which he found in some other women she loved and admired her handsome and fascinating husband but never appeared to take pride in his genius or his fame as a poet the accounts of virginia's beauty say those who knew her personally have been greatly exaggerated by poe's biographers who taking their impressions from the description of mr gowans already mentioned have painted the poet's child wife in the most glowing colours the general idea of her is like that which mr woodbury expresses a sylph-like creature of such delicate and ethereal beauty that we almost expect to see it vanish away like one of poe's own creations but the real virginia was neither delicate nor ethereal she is described by those who knew her at the age of twenty-two as looking more like a girl of fifteen than a woman grown with notwithstanding her frail health a round full face and figure full pouting lips a forehead too high and broad for beauty and bright black eyes and raven black hair contrasting almost startlingly with a white and colourless complexion her manner and expression were soft and shy with something childlike and appealing 
she was liked by everyone says mr graham a decided lisp added to her childlikeness end of chapter sixteen chapter seventeen of the home life of poe by susan archer weiss this librivox recording is in the public domain poe's philadelphia home poe disappointed in his hopes of success in new york left that city and in the summer of eighteen thirty nine removed to philadelphia then the literary centre of the united states of his business experiences while here his successes and disappointments his quarrels with certain editors and literary men and his friendly relations with others his biographers have informed us but it is in his home and private life that we are interested their financial circumstances at this time must have been deplorable for they had to borrow money to enable them to remove to philadelphia under the circumstances to take board was impracticable and it appears from the reminiscences of certain neighbors that they for some time occupied very poor lodgings in an obscure street in the vicinity of a market but poe was much more successful here than in new york and we find them in the following spring established in a home of their own in a locality known as spring garden a quiet suburb far from the dust and noise of the city some one has recently taken pains to hunt out with infinite patience and perseverance this house which the poes occupied for nearly five years it was an ordinary framed dutch-roofed building with but three rooms on the ground floor and under the eaves little horizontal strips of windows on a level with the floor which could scarcely have admitted light and air but there was when they took possession a bit of grassy side yard which had once been part of a garden and a porch over which grew a straggling rose bush this latter mrs clem's skilful hands carefully pruned and trained thus winning for the humble abode the title still applied to it of the poet's rose-embowered cottage to which some enthusiast has added where poe and his idolized virginia dreamed their divine dream of love to a lady who was at this time a resident of spring garden we are indebted for a glimpse of the poes in this their quiet and half rural abode twice a day on my way to and from school she said i had to pass their house and in summer time often saw them in the mornings mrs clem and her daughter would be generally watering the flowers which they had in a bed under the windows they seemed always cheerful and happy and i could hear mrs poe's laugh before i turned the corner mrs clem was always busy i have seen her of mornings clearing the front yard washing the windows in the stoop and even whitewashing the palings you would notice how clean and orderly everything looked she rented out her front room to lodgers and used the middle room next to the kitchen for their own living room or parlor they must have slept under the roof we never heard that they were poor and they kept pretty much to themselves in the two years we lived near them i don't think that in that time i saw mr poe half a dozen times we heard that he was dissipated but he always appeared like a gentleman though thin and sickly looking his wife was the picture of health it was after we moved away that she became an invalid mrs clem she added was a dress and cloak maker and she thinks that mrs poe assisted her as she would sometimes see the latter seated on the stoop engaged in sewing she was pretty but not noticeably so she was too fleshy this account refers to a time when poe was assistant editor of the gentleman's magazine and the family were enjoying a degree of peace and prosperity such as they never subsequently knew poe lost this position according to mr burton the editor-in-chief by indulgence in dissipated habits in replying to this charge he wrote to a friend mr snodgrass that on the honor of a gentleman he had not since leaving richmond tasted anything stronger than cider and that upon one occasion only in this he was borne out by the testimony of mrs clem who asserted i know that for years he never tasted even a glass of wine mr burton in making the charge adds i believe that for eighteen months previous to this time he had not drank 
still the severity and one might say almost cruelty of his personal criticisms continued and nothing could exceed the bitterness of his vituperation against those by whom as he conceived he had been wronged or unjustly treated mr burton in replying in a forbearing and even kindly manner to a very abusive letter from him advised him to lay aside his ill-feeling against his fellow-writers and to cultivate a more tolerant and kindly spirit he even proposed that poe should resume his place upon the magazine but this he proudly declined and continued to contribute his brilliant stories to other periodicals these attracted the attention of mr graham who had just established the magazine which bore his name and who offered him the editorship which poe accepted and gave to it his best work under his management it prospered wonderfully and soon became the leading periodical of the country still with a good salary and a brilliant literary reputation poe was dissatisfied the old restlessness and discontent returned what he desired was a magazine of his own for which he might be at liberty to write according to his own will his independent and ambitious spirit revolted at being limited to certain bounds and controlled by what he considered the narrow views of editors we find him as early as june twenty sixth eighteen forty one writing to mr snodgrass notwithstanding graham's unceasing civility and real kindness i am more and more disgusted with my situation it ended at length in his resigning the editorship of graham's and devoting himself to writing for other publications a step which was the beginning of a long period of financial and other troubles from colonel de sole editor of noah's new york sunday times who as a resident of philadelphia about that time knew poe well i gained some information concerning him his dissipation the colonel said was too notorious to be denied and that for days and even weeks at a time he would be sharing the bachelor life and quarters of his associates who were not aware that he was a married man he would on some evenings when sober come to the rooms occupied by himself and some other writers for the press and producing the manuscript of the raven read to them the last additions to it asking their opinion and suggestions he seemed to be having difficulty with it said colonel de sole and to be very doubtful as to its merits as a poem the general opinion of these critics was against it the irregular habits of this summer resulted in the fall eighteen thirty nine in a severe illness the first of the peculiar attacks to which poe during the rest of his life was at intervals subject on recovering he devoted himself to the realization of a plan for establishing a magazine of his own to be called the pen magazine and wrote to mr snodgrass that his prospects were glorious and that he intended to give it the reputation of using no article except from the best writers and that in criticism it was to be sternly absolutely just with both friends and foe independent of the medium of a publisher's will in these last words we read the whole secret of his past dissatisfaction and of his future aspiration as an editor the pen magazine was advertised to appear on january first eighteen forty one but this scheme was balked by a financial depression which at that time occurred throughout the country but who will not sympathize with poe and admit that considering the disappointments to which he was continually subject and the constant humiliation and drawback of the poverty which met him on every hand balking each movement and design together with the ill health from which he was now destined to be a constant sufferer his faults and failures should not be treated with every possible allowance if he were naturally weak and lacking in the strength and firmness of will to determinately resist obstacles and discouragements we see it in the effect of the heredity apparent in his sister and consequently so much greater is his claim to be leniently judged End of chapter seventeen Chapter eighteen of the Home Life of Poe by Susan Archer Weiss. 
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Virginia's Illness in all this time of which we have spoken embracing a period of several years mrs clem and her daughter continued their quiet life at the cottage the former doing what she could toward the support and comfort of the family but a great affliction was to befall them in the dangerous illness of virginia now in her twenty-first year who had the misfortune while singing to break a small blood vessel she had already developed signs of consumption and from this time forth remained more or less an invalid subject to occasional hemorrhages but from all accounts losing none of her characteristic cheerfulness and light-heartedness poe was at this time still engaged in the editorship of graham's magazine and it is now that we begin to hear of him in the character of a devoted husband watching beside the sick-bed of an idolized wife with which the world is familiar certainly the condition of the helpless creature who so clung to him and the real danger which threatened her was calculated to awaken all the tenderness of his nature she could not bear the slightest exposure wrote mr harris in hearth and home all needed the utmost care and all those conveniences as to apartment and surroundings which are so important in the case of an invalid and yet the room where she lay for weeks hardly able to breathe except as she was fanned was a little place with the ceiling so low over the narrow bed that her head almost touched it mr graham tells how he saw poe hovering around his wife's couch with fond fear and tender anxiety shuddering visibly at her slightest cough and mentions his driving out with them one summer day and of the husband's watchful eyes eagerly bent on the slightest change in that beloved face another literary friend of poe's who visited the family in this time of trial mr clark tells of his once taking his little daughter with him knowing virginia to be fond of the companionship of children and as a proof of the latter's light-heartedness relates how the little girl was induced to sing a comic song which virginia received with peal after peal of merry laughter the reminiscences of these kindly gentlemen who at poe's own request called upon him regarding the poet and his family are of the most flattering character poe in his own home was the perfection of graceful courtesy and mrs clem amiably dignified with a countenance when speaking of her children almost saint-like in its expression of patience and motherly devotion of virginia mr harris says she looked hardly more than fourteen was soft fair and girlish he says furthermore that mrs poe whom he had not known previous to her misfortune had up to that time possessed a voice of marvellous sweetness and a harp and piano which leads an english writer to represent the poet's wife as an accomplished musician with the voice of a saint cecilia this is a specimen of the exaggeration to which biographers sometimes lend themselves to be taken up by those who follow and received by the public as a fact poe now again interested himself in getting up a magazine to which he gave the name of the stylus and there seemed an even more brilliant prospect than before of its success he wrote a prospectus and went to washington to obtain subscriptions from president tyler and the cabinet but was taken ill the result it was said of his meeting with a convivial acquaintance and mrs clem being notified thereof on his return to philadelphia met him at the railroad station and took him home in safety from further possible temptation owing partly to this indiscretion the stylus was again a failure and the matter being known throughout the city did not add to poe's personal reputation now also just as for the first time poe began to be mentioned in the character of a devoted husband there arose a widespread scandal concerning a handsome and wealthy woman whom it was said he accompanied to saratoga and who was paying his expenses there but while the story appears to have been so far true it certainly admits of a different construction from that given by the gossips poe was at this time in wretched health hardly able to attend to his literary work and in consequence the financial condition of himself and his family was deplorable 
what more probable than that some kind friend of his seeing the absolute necessity to him of a change should have invited him to be her guest at the quiet summer resort near saratoga to which she was going it was a more delicate and for him a safer way than to have supplied him with money on his own account the lady it was said had her own little turnout in which they daily drove into saratoga and this exercise with the mineral waters the nourishing food and other advantages of the place doubtless secured to him the benefits which his friend desired it is impossible to believe that poe could have so defied public opinion as to have voluntarily given cause for a scandal of this nature for which the gossip of a public watering-place should alone be held responsible poe now again applied himself to his writing but for some reason with but little success in desperation he hastily finished the manuscript of the raven and offered it to graham who not satisfied as to its merits as a poem declined it but expressed a willingness to abide by the decision of a number of the office employees clerks and others who being called in sat solemnly attentive and critical while poe read to them the poem their decision was against it but on learning of the poet's penniless condition and that as he confessed he had not money to buy medicine for his sick wife they made up a subscription of fifteen dollars which was given not to poe himself but to mrs clem for the use of the sick lady this account given in a new york paper by one of the office committee many years after the poet's death has been denied by a mr william johnston who was at that time an office boy in graham's employ he says that he was present at the reading of the poem and that no subscription was taken up this may have been done subsequently without his knowledge of poe he spoke in the most enthusiastic terms of admiration and affection as the kindest and most courteous gentleman that he had ever met with prompt and industrious at his work and having always a pleasant word and smile for himself he never in the course of poe's engagement with graham saw him otherwise than perfectly sober End of chapter eighteen chapter nineteen of the home life of poe by susan archer weiss the sleeper vox recording is in the public domain back to new york poe discouraged and with the old restlessness upon him suddenly resolved to leave philadelphia on the sixth of april eighteen forty four he started with virginia for new york leaving mrs clem to settle their affairs in general most fortunately for poe's memory there remains to us a letter written by him to mrs clem in which he gives her an account of their journey it is of so private and confidential a nature and speaks so frankly and freely of such small domestic matters as most persons do not care to have exposed to strangers that in reading it one feels almost as if violating the sacredness of domestic privacy but i here refer to it as showing poe's domestic character in a most attractive light new york sunday morning april seven just after breakfast my dear muddy we have just at this moment done breakfast and i now sit down to write you about everything in the first place we arrived safe at walnut street wharf the driver wanted me to pay him a dollar but i wouldn't then i had to pay a boy a levy to put the trunks in the baggage car in the meantime i took sis into the depot hotel it was only a quarter past six and we had to wait until seven we started in good spirits but did not get here until nearly three o'clock sissy coughed none at all when we got to the wharf it was raining hard i left her on board the boat after putting the trunks in the ladies cabin and set off to buy an umbrella and look for a boarding house i met a man selling umbrellas and bought one for twenty-five cents then i went up greenwich street and soon found a boarding house it has brownstone steps and a porch with brown pillars morrison is the name on the door i made a bargain in a few minutes and then got a hack and went for sis i was not gone more than half an hour and she was quite astonished to see me back so soon she didn't expect me for an hour there were two other ladies on board so she wasn't very lonely 
when we got to the house we had to wait about half an hour till the room was ready the cheapest board that i ever knew taking into consideration the central situation and the living i wish kate virginia's pet cat catalina could see it she would faint last night for supper we had the nicest tea you ever drank strong and hot wheat bread and rye bread cheese tea cakes elegant a good dish two dishes of elegant ham and two of cold veal piled up like a mountain in large slices three dishes of the cakes and everything in the greatest profusion no fear of our starving here the landlady seemed as if she could not press us enough and we were at home directly her husband is living with her a fat good-natured old soul there are eight or ten boarders two or three of them ladies two servants for breakfast we had excellent flavored coffee hot and strong not too clear and no great deal of cream veal cutlets elegant ham and eggs and nice bread and butter i never sat down to a more plentiful or a nicer breakfast i wish you could have seen the eggs and the great dishes of meat i ate the first hearty breakfast i have eaten since we left our little home sis is delighted and we are both in excellent spirits she has coughed hardly any and had to-night no night sweat she is now mending my pants which i tore against a nail i went out last night and bought a skein of silk a skein of thread two buttons and a tin pan for the stove the fire kept in all night we have now got four dollars and a half left to-morrow i am going to try and borrow three dollars so that i might have a fortnight to go upon i feel in excellent spirits and have not drank a drop so that i hope soon to get out of trouble the very instant that i scrape together enough money i will send it on you can't imagine how much we both miss you sissy had a hearty cry last night because you and catalina weren't there we are resolved to get two rooms the first moment we can in the meantime it is impossible that we can be more comfortable or more at home than we are be sure to go to the p o and have my letters forwarded it looks as if it were going to clear up now as soon as i can write the article for lowell i will send it to you and get you to get the money from graham give our best love to catalina signature cut out here in this letter written as simply and as unreservedly as that of a child to its mother we see poe himself poe in his real nature not the poet with his studied affectation of gloom and sadness not the critic severe in his judgment of all that did not agree with his standard of literary excellence and not even the society man wearing the mask of cold and proud reserve but poe himself poe the man shut in from the eye of the world in the privacy of his home life and the companionship of his own family who would recognize in this gentle kindly and tender man with his playful mood and his affectionate consideration for those whom he loved even for catalina the morbid and enigmatical being that the world chooses to imagine him the gloomy wanderer amid the ghoul-haunted regions of weir the despairing soul forever brooding over the memory of his lost lenore and how readily he yields himself to the enjoyment of the moment how cheerful he is in a situation which would depress any other man a stranger in a strange city just making a new start in life with four dollars and a half to begin with surely there is something most pathetic in all this as we see it from poe's own unconscious pen with the purchase of the twenty-five cent umbrella to shield sissy from the rain the two buttons and the skein of thread and ever mindful of sissy's comfort the tin pan for the stove the picture is invaluable as enabling us to understand the true characters of poe and his wife and the peculiar relations existing between them virginia trusting loving and happy and poe all kindness and protective tenderness for his little sissy we look upon it as a lifelike photograph clear and distinct in every line poe with the traces of care and anxiety for the time swept away from his face and virginia as she is described at this time a woman grown but looking not more than fourteen 
plump and smiling with her bright black eyes and full pouting lips it is poe himself who reveals her character as no other has done when he says that though delighted with her new experience and situation she yet had a hearty cry childlike missing her mother and her cat it would have been well for them could they have remained at this model cheap boarding-house where they were so well provided for but it was beyond their means with board for three persons and so they look about for two rooms and when ready send for mrs clem and catalina two rooms for the three in one of which mrs clem must perform all her domestic operations of cooking and laundering for as we afterwards learn poe was indebted to his mother-in-law for that immaculate linen in which however shabby the outer garments he invariably appeared and despite the threadbare suit he was always it was said as well groomed and scrupulously neat as the most fastidious gentleman could be that in new york poe did not at first succeed according to his expectations is rendered evident by the fact that in the following october he being ill mrs clem applied to n p willis for some employment for him who gave him a place in his office as assistant editor willis says that mrs clem's countenance as she pleaded for her son-in-law was beautiful and saintly by reason of an evident complete giving up of her life to privation and sorrowful tenderness to those whom she loved of poe he says that he was a quiet patient industrious and most gentlemanly person commanding the utmost respect and good feeling of every one he also says in speaking of a lecture which he delivered about this time before the new york lyceum and which was attended by several hundred persons he becomes a desk his beautiful head showing like a statuary embodiment of discrimination his accent like a knife through water it was now in january eighteen forty five that the raven was published in the evening mirror taking the world by storm probably no one was more surprised at its immediate success than was poe himself who as he afterwards stated to a friend had never had much opinion of the poem he now found himself elevated to the highest rank of american literary fame and with this his worldly fortune should also have risen yet we find him going on in the same rut as before writing but little for the magazine and for that being poorly paid too poorly to enable the family to live in any degree of comfort from one cheap lodging to another they removed with such frequency as to suggest to us the suspicion that their rent was not always ready when due but after some time the old discontent returned upon poe willis and the mirror were too narrow for him and he sought and was fortunate enough to obtain a place on the broadway journal at that time the leading journal of the day and of which he was soon appointed assistant editor with a good salary the family were now enabled to live in more comfort they rented a front and back room on the third story of an old house on east broadway which had once been the residence of a prosperous merchant but had long ago been given over to the use of poor but respectable tenants it was musty and mouldy but here they were elevated somewhat above the noise and dust of the street and had sunlight and a good view from the narrow windows it was here that late one evening mr r h stoddard whose sarcastic pen is so well known called on poe instead of at his office to inquire the fate of a certain ode which he had sent to the broadway journal for publication necessarily he was received in the front room which was virginia's the following is his account of the visit poe received me with the courtesy habitual with him when he was himself and gave me to understand that my ode would be published in the next number of his paper what did he look like he was dressed in black from head to foot except of course that his linen was spotlessly white the most noticeable things about him were his high forehead dark hair and sharp black eye his cousin wife always an invalid was lying on a bed between himself and me she never stirred but her mother came out of the back parlor and was introduced to me by her courtly nephew 
stoddard is here mistaken in his description of poe's eyes they were neither sharp nor black but large soft dreamy eyes of a fine steel gray clear as crystal and with a jet black pupil which would in certain lights expand until the eyes appeared to be all black stoddard continues i saw poe once again and for the last time it was a rainy afternoon such as we have in our november and he was standing under an awning waiting for the shower to pass over my conviction was that i ought to offer him my umbrella and go home with him but i left him standing there and there i see him still and shall always poor and penniless but proud reliant dominant may the gods forgive me i can never forgive myself in april five months after this time poe's old habits unfortunately returned upon him mr lowell one day in passing through new york called to see him when mrs clem excused his strange actions by frankly stating that edgar was not himself that day she afterward made the same statement to mr briggs whose assistant editor poe was and who writes june eighteen forty five to lowell i believe he had not drank anything for more than eighteen months until the last three months and concludes that he would have to dispense with his services the matter was settled however by poe's proposing to buy the broadway journal hoping to make of it in a measure what he had desired for the stylus the prospect seemed to promise fair enough for its success and mr greeley and mr griswold each generously contributed a sum of fifty dollars but the plan finally failed for want of sufficient funds george poe to whom edgar applied remembering his former unpaid loan making no response to his appeal this was another great disappointment to poe just as on former occasions his hopes seemed on the point of realization thus in whatever direction he turned grim poverty faced and frowned him down surely it was enough to discourage him and yet to the end of his life he eagerly followed this elusive hope mrs clem too who had in this time been trying to support the family by keeping a boarding-house also met with her disappointments for some reason her boarders never remained long with her and the family who had removed to obscure lodgings on amity street now found themselves in one of their frequent seasons of poverty and distress End of chapter nineteen chapter twenty of the home life of poe by susan archer weiss this librivox recording is in the public domain poe and mrs osgood it was a fortunate day when mrs clem hunting about the suburbs of the great city for a cheap place of abode discovered the little cottage at fordham a country railroad station some miles from new york it was but a humble place at best an old cottage of four rooms in ill repair but the rent was low the situation on the summit of a rocky knoll pleasant affording fine views of the harlem river and there was pure air plenty of outdoor space and that famous cherry tree now in the month of may in full and fragrant bloom a few repairs were made and mrs clem's vigorous hands with the assistance of soap and water and whitewash soon transformed the neglected abode into a miracle of neatness and order checked matting hid the worn parlor floor and the cheap furniture which they had brought with them looked better here than ever it had done in the cramped and stuffy rooms of the city outside a neglected rose bush was trained against the wall supplying virginia with roses in its season her room was above the parlor at the head of a narrow staircase a low ceiling department with sloping walls and small square windows and it was here at a desk or table near his wife's sick-bed that most of poe's writing was now done in the preceding winter virginia's health had apparently greatly improved and her illness was not of so serious a nature as to confine her entirely to the house or to interfere with the social or literary engagements of her husband who was as poet lecturer editor and critic at the zenith of his fame 
in this time he had attended the soirees of miss lynch and others of the literary class once or twice accompanied by his wife at these he made the acquaintance of mrs hewitt mrs elizabeth oak smith and mrs e f ellett with others of the starry sisterhood of poetesses as they were called by some poetaster of the day with each of whom he in succession formed one of the sentimental platonic friendships to which he was given all these however were destined to yield to the superior attractions of a sister poetess mrs francis sargent osgood wife of the artist of that name mrs osgood at this time about thirty years of age is described by r h stoddard as a paragon not only loved by men but liked by women as well attractive in person bright witty and sweet-natured she won even the splenatic thomas dunn english and the stoical greeley whose approval of her was as frankly expressed as was his denunciation of the ugliness self-conceit and disagreeableness of her friend the transcendentalist margaret fuller poe who had written a very flattering notice of mrs osgood's poems in return for which she addressed him some lines in the character of israfel obtained an introduction and visited her frequently also at his request she called upon his wife and friendly relations were soon established between them to her after poe's death we are indebted for a characteristic picture of the poet and his wife in their home in amity street and which though almost too well known for repetition i will give here as a specimen of his home life it was in his own simple yet poetical home that the character of edgar poe appeared to me in his most beautiful light playful affectionate witty alternately docile and wayward as a petted child for his young gentle and idolized wife and for all who came he had even in the midst of the most harassing literary duties a kind word a pleasant smile a graceful and courteous attention at his desk beneath the romantic picture of his loved and lost lenore patient assiduous uncomplaining tracing in an exquisitely clear chiography and with almost superhuman swiftness the lightning thoughts the rare and radiant fancies as they flowed through his wonderful brain for hours i have listened entranced to his strains of almost celestial eloquence i recollect one morning toward the close of his residence in this city when he seemed unusually gay and light-hearted virginia his sweet wife had written me a pressing invitation to come to them and i who never could resist her affectionate summons and who enjoyed his society far more in his own home than elsewhere hastened to amity street i found him just completing his series of papers called the literati of new york now said he displaying in laughing triumph several little rolls of narrow paper he always wrote thus for the press i am going to show you by the difference in length in these the different degrees of estimation in which i hold all you literary people in each of these one of you is rolled up and fully discussed come virginia and help me and one by one they unfolded them at last they came to one which seemed interminable virginia laughingly ran to one corner of the room with one end and her husband went to the opposite with the other and whose linked sweetness long drawn out is that said i hear her he cried just as if her little vain heart didn't tell her it's herself from this account the exaggerated phrases of which will be noted it would appear that a great degree of intimacy existed between poe and his fair visitor when he could in his own home the two tiny rooms in amity street write hour after hour undisturbed by her presence virginia was delighted with her new friend but mrs clem noting these frequent and lengthy visits regarded her with a suspicious eye too well she knew of the platonic friendships of her eddy but there appeared something in this affair beyond what was usual and in fact gossip had already begun to link together their names mrs osgood herself seems to have relied upon mrs poe's frequent invitations and fondness for her society as a shield against meddlesome tongues but in vain 
for not only were the jealous and vigilant eyes of poe's mother-in-law bent upon her but those of the starry sisterhood as well there was a flutter and a chatter in the literary dovecoat and at length one of the starry ones mrs ellet concluded it to be her bounden duty to inquire into the matter calling at fordham one day in poe's absence she and mrs clem who had probably never before met engaged in a confidential discussion in the course of which the irate mother-in-law showed the visitor a letter from mrs osgood to poe one wonders how she got possession of that letter the contents of which were so opposed to all the latter's ideas of propriety that it was clear that something would have to be done eventually two of the starry ones of whom one was margaret fuller waited upon mrs osgood whom they advised to commission them to demand of poe the return of her letters which strangely enough she did though probably only as a conciliatory measure poe in his exasperation at this unwarrantable intermeddling remarked significantly that mrs ellet had better come and look after her own letters upon which she sent to demand them but he meantime had cut her acquaintance by leaving them at her own door without either written word or message very much we may imagine as dean swift strode into vanessa's presence and threw at her feet her letter to stella this was either in may or early june shortly after their removal to fordham poe had no idea of allowing this episode to interfere with his visits to mrs osgood and the gossip continued until to avoid further annoyance she left new york and went to albany on a visit to her brother-in-law dr harrington on the twelfth of june we find poe writing an affectionate note to his wife explaining why he stays away from her that night and concluding with sleep well and god grant you a peaceful summer with your devoted edgar a few days after this toward the end of june he was in albany making passionate love to mrs osgood in dismay she left that city and went to boston whither he followed her and again to lowell and providence giving rise to a widespread scandal which caused the lady infinite trouble and distress but mrs osgood brilliant talented and virtuous was also kind-hearted to a fault and where her feelings and sympathies were appealed to amiably weak instead of indignantly and determinately rejecting poe's impassioned love-making she says she pitied him argued with him appealed to his reason and better feelings and in special reminded him of his sick wife who lay dying at home and longing for his presence finally she returned to albany and poe ill at a hotel wrote urgently to mrs clem for money to pay his board bill and take him back to fordham End of chapter 20「It was at this time, in the summer of 1845, that Poe's sister, Miss Rosalie Poe, went on a visit to her brother, whom she had not seen in ten years. On her return home, and for years thereafter, she was accustomed to speak of this visit, and it was a curious picture which she gave of the life of the poet and his family in the humble little cottage on fordham hill poe was away when she arrived presumably in his insane pursuit of mrs osgood miss poe told of aunt clem's distress and anxiety on his account and of how she scraped together every penny and borrowed money from herself to send to edgar who she said had been taken ill while on a business trip there were no provisions in the house scarcely and she herself both then and at various other times would purchase supplies from the market and grocers wagons which passed for there were no stores at the little country station of fordham miss poe told of her brother's arrival at home and of how she overheard mrs clem administering to him a severe scolding he was so ill that he had to be put to bed by mrs clem who sat up with him all night while he talked out of his head and begged for morphine after some days he was better 
and walked about the house and sat under the pine trees crowning a rocky knoll within calling distance of the house ever a constant and favorite retreat of his offering fine views of the river and neighboring country one day still weak and ill he sat at his desk and looked over his papers mrs clem then took his place and wrote at his dictation aunt clem said rosalie could exactly imitate edgar's writing on the following day she filled her satchel with some of these papers and went to the city whence she returned late in the evening quite after dark with a hamper of provisions and medicines to virginia's great delight who had feared some mishap to her mother and cried accordingly miss poe believed that this hamper was a present from some one but aunt clem was very reserved toward her in regard to her affairs she knew she said that mrs clem had never liked her but edgar and virginia were kind from this time poe wrote industriously seldom going to town but sending his mother-in-law instead several times mrs clem gave her niece some copying to do but this was not to her a very gratifying task and when on her return home she was asked what it was about had not the least idea she always insisted that annabel lee was written at this time as she repeatedly heard edgar read it to mrs clem and also to himself and recognized it when it was published two years afterward a curious picture was that which she gave of the poet's reading his manuscript to his mother-in-law while the latter sat beside his desk inking the worn seams of his and her own garments or of poe seated on a settle outside the kitchen door also reading to her some of his rare and radiant fancies while she presided over the family laundry he seems to have been constantly appealing to her sympathy with his writing but never to virginia according to miss poe mrs clem was at this time dependent for her own earnings on her sewing and fancy knitting with pretty knick-knacks which she disposed of at a certain notion store virginia too when well enough liked this kind of work they had few visitors for mrs clem too busy for gossip made a point of discouraging calls from the neighbors with the exception of two or three families of better class than most of those surrounding them these latter were a half rural people keeping dairies and cultivating market gardens miss poe spoke of virginia's cheerfulness nothing ever disturbed her she was always laughing she liked to have children about her and they came every day bringing their dolls and playthings with little offerings of fruit and flowers from their home gardens she taught them to cut out and make their dolls dresses and would sometimes be very merry with them she did not appear to suffer said miss poe did not lose flesh and had always a hearty appetite eating what the others ate though very fond of nice things especially candy her mother and edgar petted her like a baby aunt clem and virginia declared miss poe with conviction cared for nobody but themselves and edgar virginia was at this time twenty-four years of age it was not to be wondered at that as miss poe said her brother immediately after his return remained at home seldom going into town but sending his mother to dispose of his manuscripts it has been said that when he did make his appearance in the city and among his usual business haunts he found himself everywhere coldly received in consequence of the notorious episode with mrs osgood for whom it was known he had left his sick wife his literary enemies of whom he had made many by his keen criticisms made the most of this charge against him in addition to that of dissipated habits to which he now gave himself up with a recklessness which he had never before shown poe afterward attempted to defend himself against this reproach and the whole scandal of this season by attributing its excesses to his grief and anxiety on account of his wife whom he says he loved as man never loved before a phrase the extravagance of which betrays its insincerity he describes how through the years of her illness he loved her more and more dearly 
and clung to her with the most desperate pertinacity until he became insane with intervals of horrible sanity during these fits of absolute unconsciousness i drank and thus he endeavours to explain away his pursuit of mrs osgood it cannot but be noted that in all poe's accounts of himself and especially of his feelings is a palpable affectation and exaggeration with an extravagance of expression bordering on the tragic and melodramatic a style which is exemplified in some of his writings and may be equally imaginative in both cases mrs osgood also in her reminiscences after poe's death sought to clear both him and herself from the scandal of that summer by writing of the affection and confidence existing between himself and his wife his idolized virginia as she saw them in their home and declares her belief that his wife was the only woman whom he had ever really loved in this we do not feel disposed to question her sincerity touching the slander against herself she wrote to a friend you have proof in mrs poe's letters to me and poe's to mrs ellet either of which would fully establish my innocence neither of them as you know were persons likely to take much trouble to prove a woman's innocence and it was only because she felt that i had been cruelly wronged by her mother and mrs ellet that she impulsively rendered me this justice of course the letter of mrs poe here referred to was written at the suggestion of her husband but it is curious to observe how frankly and naively mrs osgood not now writing for the public expresses her real opinion of poe and his wife mrs osgood goes on to say oh it is too cruel that i the only one of all those women who did not seek his acquaintance should be sought out after his death as the only victim to suffer from the slanders of his mother from this it would appear that after poe's death the old scandal was revived and by mrs clem herself about this time she was having frequent interviews with dr griswold in regard to poe's papers which she had handed over to him for use in the memoirs upon which he was engaged naturally mrs clem who never seems to have forgiven mrs osgood for the troubles of that unfortunate first summer at fordham would express herself freely to griswold who was a warm friend and admirer of mrs osgood was it on account of such utterances that griswold wrote to mrs whitman be very careful what you say to mrs clem she is not your friend or anybody's friend and has no element of goodness or kindness in her nature but whose heart is full of wickedness and malice mrs osgood was a lovely and estimable woman and if she did allow her admiration of poe and her warm-hearted sympathy with one of a kindred poetic nature to impulsively carry her beyond the bounds of a strictly platonic friendship it was in all innocence on her part and did not lose her the good opinion of those who knew her the blame was all for poe and the feeling against him intense undoubtedly the impression which she made on poe was something beyond what he ordinarily experienced toward women in my own acquaintance with him he several times spoke of her and always with a sort of grave and reverential tenderness as one may speak of the dead or as he might have spoken of the lost friend of his boyhood mrs stannard although as mrs osgood says poe and herself never met in the few remaining years of their lives yet several of his poems without any real attempt at disguise express his remembrance of her it was to her that the lines to f were addressed after their parting beloved amid the earnest woes that crowd around my earthly path dear path alas where grows not e'en one thornless rose my soul at last a solace hath in dreams of thee and therein knows an eden of calm repose and thus thy memory is to me like some enchanted far-off isle in some tumultuous sea some ocean throbbing far and free with storms but where meanwhile serenest skies continually just o'er that one bright island smile 
in a dream he thus again alludes to her that holy dream that holy dream when all the world was chiding hath cheered me like a lovely beam a lonely spirit guiding what though that light through storm and night still trembles from afar what could there be more purely bright than truth's day star about the same time he wrote the lines to my mother the only one of his poems in which he alluded to his wife concluding with the couplet by that infinitude which made my wife dearer unto my soul than its own life it will be observed that the sentimental things in both prose and verse which poe has written concerning his love for his wife and they are but two or three at most were written immediately after his affair with mrs osgood and the universal charge against him that he had deserted a dying wife for her sake it is impossible at this remote period of time it could be understood how seriously from all contemporaneous accounts poe's reputation was affected by this unfortunate episode especially at the north where it was best known when miss poe left fordham in july she carried with her a letter from mrs clem to mr john mackenzie soliciting pecuniary aid for edgar on plea of his wretched health mr mackenzie was at this time married and with a family of his own but he never lost his interest in his old friend or ceased to assist him so far as was in his power End of chapter twenty one chapter twenty two of the home life of poe by susan archer weiss this librivox recording is in the public domain the shadow at the door during the winter and succeeding summer matters did not improve at the cottage poe with health completely shattered and spirits horribly depressed remained at home with his sick wife for the most part only occasionally arousing himself to write a lady who was at this time a little girl and one of virginia's visitors afterward told a reporter of how she would sometimes see mr poe writing at his table in the upstairs room and how as each sheet was finished he would paste it on to the last one until it was long enough to reach across the floor then she would venture to roll it up for him in a neat cylinder taking care not to disturb him sometimes when he was not employed he would tell the children blood-curdling stories of ghouls and goblins when his eyes would light up in a wonderful manner i lost my heart to those beautiful eyes she said mrs clem continued to make the rounds of the editor's offices with these manuscripts but met with little success poe's mind was not at its brightest he was not in a writing mood and as has been since observed he was reduced to the expedient of rewriting and altering certain smaller articles and offering them to the more obscure papers and journals mrs clem in the midst of her manifold duties could do but little with her sewing in the way of support for the family so her furniture went piece by piece the furniture which miss poe had so often described the parlor box lounge upon which she slept the dining-table which stood in the midst of the room ready for the meal which was so seldom placed upon it the large engraving above the mantelpiece and the collection of sea-shells all disappeared until the once cosy little apartment presented a bare and poverty-stricken appearance mrs gove one of the literary women of the day described it as being furnished with only a checked matting a small corner stand a hanging shelf of books and four chairs years afterward when strangers would visit the cottage at fordham they would hear from the neighbors pathetic accounts of the family during this summer of eighteen forty six we knew that they were poor said one but they tried to keep it to themselves many a time i have wanted to send them things from my garden but was afraid to do so one old dame said to a new york reporter i've known when they were out of provisions for then mrs clem who always seemed cheerful would come out with a basket and a shining case knife and go round digging greens dandelions once i said to her says i greens may be took too frequent oh no says she smiling they cool the blood and eddie likes them 
thus poor mrs clem with her assumed cheerfulness would seek to produce the impression that their dinner of wild herbs was a matter of choice instead of necessity another neighbor said to a visitor i never saw checked matting last as theirs did there was nothing upstairs but an old cot in a little hall room or closet where mrs clem slept and an old table and chair and bed in the next room where mr poe wrote but you could eat your dinner off the two floors the testimony of still another was in the kitchen she had only a little stove a pine table and a chair but the floor was as white as the table and the tins as bright as silver i don't think that she had more than a dozen pieces of crockery all on a little shelf in the kitchen the only meat i've ever known them to have was a five-cent bone for soup or a few butcher's trimmings for a stew but it seemed mrs clem could make a little of anything go twice as far as other people could in the early part of this summer virginia's health appeared better than usual a neighbor who lived nearest them said to a visitor to poe's old home in fine weather that summer the summer before she died we could sometimes see her sitting at her front door wrapped up with her husband or mother beside her mr poe reading a newspaper and mrs clem knitting most times there would be one or two children along and mr poe would play ball with them while his wife laughingly looked on she looked like a child herself hardly taller than they were well no she wasn't exactly pretty she looked too spooky with her white face and big black eyes but she was interesting looking and we felt sorry for her and for them all for that matter you could see they'd known better days as the summer wore on and the first autumn breezes shook the leaves from the cherry tree a change came over virginia mrs clem wrote to miss poe that unless she could go to her relations in the south a thing not to be thought of she would not live through the winter eddie's health was completely broken and unless she herself remained strong enough to take care of them both all would have to go to the poorhouse these letters were generally indirect appeals for pecuniary aid through similar pathetic accounts given by mrs clem to editors to whom she offered manuscripts the condition of the poet and his family became known and was commented upon by the public papers to pose great indignation who took occasion in an anonymous communication to deny its truth but that it was no time for pride to stand in the way of dire necessity is evident from the account of mrs gove on her first visit to the cottage late in that fall one can hardly realize a condition of things such as she described the bare and fireless room the bed with its thin white covering and the military cloak a relic of the west point days spread over it and the sick woman whose only means of warmth was as her husband held her hands and her mother her feet while she herself hugged a large tortoiseshell cat to her bosom and the thin haggard man suffering like his wife from cold and the lack of nourishing food but who yet received his visitor with such courtly elegance of manner was the author of the raven with which the world was even then being thrilled it was a blessed day for the distressed family that on which about the last of october mrs shoe came to the now bleak little cottage on the hill and like a ministering angel devoted herself to caring for and comforting them not only as regarded their material wants but with kind and encouraging words as well with a sufficient competence and the medical education given her by her father she was enabled thus to devote herself to the service of those who could not afford the attendance of a regular physician not only did she supply them with medicine but with careful nursing and proper food prepared by her own hands in mrs clem's little kitchen mrs gove collected sixty dollars with which their other wants were supplied so that during the months of november and december the family were more comfortably situated than was usual with them but meantime virginia rapidly declined until it became evident that her frail life was very near its close on the day before her death poe 
in mortal dread of that awful shadow which had been so long in its approach and now stood upon their threshold wrote urgently to mrs shew to come and pass the night with them my poor virginia still lives though failing fast she came in time to take leave of the dying wife one of poe's biographers has stated that on the day previous to mrs poe's death she requested mrs shew to read two letters from the second mrs allen exonerating poe from having ever caused a difficulty in her house to those who knew mrs allen and had heard from herself and her family the frequent accounts of that occurrence accounts never retracted by her to her dying day this statement is not worth a moment's consideration the only question is who wrote those letters and how is it that they were never made public or again heard of and who could have imposed upon the dying woman a task such as this instead of themselves taking the responsibility from this incident if the account be true it would appear that virginia was gentle obedient and submissive to the last on the day following january third eighteen forty seven her innocent childlike spirit passed away from earth she was in the twenty-sixth year of her age end of chapter twenty two Chapter Twenty Three of the Home Life of Poe by Susan Archer Weiss. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mrs. Shu. With the death of his wife, a great horror and gloom fell upon Poe. The blow which he had for years dreaded had at length fallen. That which he had feared and loathed above all things, the monster Death, had entered his home and made it desolate. As a poet he could delight in writing about the death of the young and lovely but from the dread reality he shrank with an almost superstitious horror and loathing it was said on mrs clem's authority that he refused to look upon the face of his dead wife he desired to have no remembrance of the features touched by the transforming fingers of death mrs shew still kindly ministered to him endeavouring also to arouse him from his gloom and encourage him to renewed effort but it seemed at first useless he had no hope or cheering beyond the grave and it was at this time that he might appropriately have written a voice from out of the future cries on on but o'er the past dim gulf my spirit hovering lies mute motionless aghast mrs shu a thoroughly practical woman of sound good sense and judgment and with so little of the aesthetic that she confessed to poe that she had never read his poems nevertheless took a friendly interest in him and felt for him in his loneliness to afford him the benefit of a change she took him as her patient to her own home and commissioned him to furnish her dining-room and library according to his own taste she also encouraged him to write placing pen and paper before him and bidding him to try and in this way it is claimed by one account the bells came to be written or at least begun under the influence of cheerful society comfort and good cheer poe's health and spirits improved and on his return home he again commenced writing soon however a relapse occurred and his kind friend and physician found it necessary to resume her visits to fordham for all this poe was grateful but unfortunately he was more and at length on a certain day he so far betrayed his feelings that mrs shew then and there informed him that her visits to him must cease on the day following she wrote a farewell letter in which she gave him advice and directions in regard to his health warning him of its precarious state and of the necessity of abandoning the habits which were making a wreck of him mentally and physically she advised him as the only thing that could save him to marry some good woman possessed of sufficient means to support him in comfort and who would love him well enough to spare him the necessity of mental overwork for which he was not now fitted it may be here remarked that of all the women we know of to whom poe offered his platonic devotion 
mrs shu was the only one by whom it was promptly and decidedly rejected end of chapter twenty three Chapter Twenty Four of *The Home Life of Poe* by Susan Archer Weiss. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Quiet Life at Fordham. The beginning of this year was a dreary time at the cottage at Fordham. The resources of the family, which had been generously contributed to, mostly by strangers and anonymously, were now exhausted and poe still ill and in wretched spirits was not capable of the exertion necessary to replenish them in the preceding summer he had by a severe criticism of thomas dunn english aroused the ire of that gentleman who revenged himself in an article for which poe brought a suit of libel recovering damages to the amount of two hundred and fifty dollars a welcome boon in a time of need he remained at home applying himself to his writing and mindful of mrs shoe's advice abstained from stimulants and took regular exercise on the country roads about fordham his frequent companion in these walks was a priest of st john's college near fordham who being an educated and intellectual man must have proven a most congenial and welcome acquaintance this priest who seems to have known poe well declares that he made a superhuman struggle against starvation and speaks of him as a gentle and amiable man easily influenced by a kind word or act most of his time said mrs clem was passed out of doors he did not like the loneliness of the house and would not remain alone in the room in which virginia had died when he chose to write at night as was sometimes the case and was particularly absorbed in his subject he would have his devoted mother-in-law sit beside him dozing in her chair and at intervals supplying him with hot coffee or catalina his wife's old pet perched upon his knee or shoulder cheering him with her gentle purring virginia's death seems to have drawn these three more closely together they could thenceforth often be seen walking up and down the garden walk poe and his mother arm in arm or with their arms about each other's waists and catalina staidly keeping pace with them rubbing and purring mrs clem told stoddard how when poe was about this time writing eureka he would walk at night up and down the veranda explaining his views and dragging her along with him until her teeth chattered and she was nearly frozen it is to be feared that he was not always sufficiently considerate of his indulgent mother-in-law poe soon experienced the benefits of his restful and temperate life health and spirits improved and he began to take an interest in the everyday things about him as spring advanced he and mrs clem laid out some flower-beds in the front garden and planted them with flowers and vines given by the neighbors until when in may the cherry tree again blossomed the little abode assumed quite an attractive appearance upon an old settle left by a former tenant and which mrs clem's skilful hands had mended and scrubbed and stained into respectability and placed beneath the cherry tree as a garden seat poe might now often be seen reclining gazing up into the branches where birds and bees flitted in and out or talking and whistling to his own pets a parrot and bobolink whose cages hung in the branches a passer-by was impressed by the picture presented quite early one summer morning of the poet and his mother standing together on the green turf smilingly looking up and talking to these pets here on the convenient settle on returning from one of his long sunrise rambles he would rest until summoned by his mother to his frugal breakfast i have at various times heard persons remark that in reading the life of a distinguished man they have desired to know some of the lesser details of his daily life as how did he dress what did he eat we have all been interested in learning that george washington liked cornbread and fried bacon for breakfast that sir walter scott was fond of oaten gills with milk and that wordsworth's favorite lunch was bread and raisins as regards poe we must go back to his sister's account of what his morning meal consisted of while she was at fordham a pretzel and two cups of strong coffee 
or when there was no pretzel the crusty part of a loaf with a bit of salt herring as a relish poe had the reputation of being a very moderate eater and of preferring simple viands even at the luxurious tables of his friends he was fond of fruit and his sister said of buttermilk and curds which they obtained from their rural neighbors but we recall his enjoyment of the elegant tea-cakes at the morrisons on greenwich street and the fried eggs for breakfast a lady who as a little girl knew poe and his mother at this time said to a correspondent of the new york commercial advertiser we lived so near them that we saw them every day they lived miserably and in abject poverty he was naturally improvident and but for the neighbors they must have starved my mother sent many a thing from her storeroom to their table he was not a man who drank in the common acceptation of the term but those were days when wine ran like water and not to serve it would seem niggardly i remember that one day muddy as mr poe called mrs clem came to our house and asked us not to offer wine to edgar as his head was weak but that he did not like to refuse it as an illustration of the fascination which poe possessed even for strangers is the following letter from mr john de galliford of chattanooga tennessee to this same new york correspondent i am drawn to you by your defence of edgar a poe i love him though i met him but once it was in september eighteen forty five i was sitting on a pile watching our bark that was moored to the pile a quiet neatly dressed gentleman came up to me and asked me numberless questions in regard to our seafaring life he was so lovable in his conversation that i never forgot him and i prize the memory of those few hours of his sweet talk with me and hold it sacred to his memory he could not have been a drinking man for his looks did not show it on my telling that i was a runaway boy from kentucky he took some scraps of paper from his pocket and took notes saying that he could make a nice story of what i had told him i took him aboard the bark and showed him a pet monkey i had brought from natal he ate a piece of biscuit and drank some cold coffee and said he would come again and see me and get acquainted with my captain this was years ago and i am now an old man seventy-three years old but i can remember word for word all that passed end of chapter twenty four chapter twenty five of the home life of poe by susan archer weiss the sleeper vox recording is in the public domain with old friends it must be admitted that poe after his affair with mrs osgood and the severe illness which followed was never again what he had been with health and spirits impaired his intellect had in a great measure lost its brilliant creative power its inspirations as we may call it and thenceforth his writings were no longer the spontaneous and irrepressible impulse of genius but the product of mental effort and labor in special had his poetic talent in a measure deserted him as is evident in his latest poems with one or two exceptions recognizing this condition and with what a pang we may imagine he recalled mrs shoe's advice in regard to a second marriage and admitting its wisdom began to look about for a suitable matrimonial partner finally his choice fell upon mrs sarah helen whitman of providence rhode island one of the poetesses of the time and the most brilliant of them all a consideration which doubtless chiefly influenced him in this choice was that mrs whitman being a lady of literary taste and independent means would be likely to take an interest in the stylus the hope of establishing which he had never abandoned and would assist him in carrying out his plans in regard to it of mrs whitman at this time about forty-five years of age i have the following account from a lady miss f h kellogg whose mother was an intimate friend and near neighbor of hers in providence she was considered very eccentric impulsive and regardless of conventionalities 
she dressed always in white and on the coldest winter evenings with snow on the ground would cross over to our house in thin slippers and with nothing on her head but a thin gauzy white scarf she probably thought this aesthetic and perhaps it was there was one thing which i must not omit to mention because it was a part of herself ether the scent accompanied her everywhere it was said she could not write except under its influence but of this i do not know as an illustration of her impulsive ways mrs kellogg says i was one evening when a little girl sitting on the front steps when she and her sister miss powers crossed over to our house they went into the parlor and i heard mrs whitman ask my sister to sing for her the mockingbird she appreciated my sister's beautiful singing but on this occasion while she was in the very midst of listen to the mockingbird suddenly a cloud of white rushed past me like a tornado and i heard mrs whitman's voice exclaiming excitedly i have it i have it of course we were all astonished and could not understand it at all until miss powers afterward explained it to us it seems that the beautiful music and singing had excited in her some poetic thought or idea and regardless or forgetful of conventionalities she had impulsively rushed home to put it in writing or perhaps in poetry before it should vanish away miss sarah jacobs one of griswold's female poets and a friend of mrs whitman describes her as small and dark with deep-set dreamy eyes that looked above and beyond but never at you quick bird-like motions and as being a believer in occult influences as poe himself professed to be for all the sweet poetic fragrance of her nature she took an interest in common things she was wise she was witty and no one could be long in her presence without becoming aware of the sweet and generous sympathy of her nature up to this time poe and mrs whitman had never met though mrs osgood says that the lady had written to him and sent him a valentine of which he had taken no notice this was against him in his present venture but he was not discouraged he set about his courtship in his usual manner by addressing to mrs whitman june ten some lines to helen commencing i saw thee once once only supposed to commemorate his first sight of her as passing her garden one july midnight he beheld her robed in white reclining on a bank of violets with her eyes raised heavenward no footstep stirred the hated world all slept save only thee and me o oh, heaven o oh god how my heart beats in coupling those two words save only thee and me so he continues he gazed entranced until the hour being past midnight and a storm cloud threatening the lady very properly arose and disappeared from his sight all but her eyes these remained and followed him home and had followed him ever since to sweetly scintillant venuses unextinguished by the sun all this must have been very gratifying to mrs whitman if she believed in it but remembering her neglected valentine she was in no haste to acknowledge the poetic offering and poe after waiting some weeks had his attention drawn in another direction he had written to his friend mr mackenzie concerning his matrimonial aspirations and he now received an answer suggesting that he come to richmond and try his fortune with an old-time schoolgirl sweetheart miss sarah elmira royster now a rich widow shelton who had several times of late inquired after him and sent her remembrances animated by this new hope he late in the summer of eighteen forty seven proceeded to richmond where he visited among his friends and called upon mrs shelton but especially paid attention to a pretty widow a mrs clark this lady when a resident of louisville kentucky many years after poe's death gave to the editor of a paper some reminiscences of him at this time the good lady was deeply interested that the world might think well of poe and grew warm on the subject of his wrongs 
she claimed that the poet was a virginian and like most virginians she is very proud of her state she wondered where gill had gotten the material for poe's vindication she had first met poe at the mackenzies when he was editor of the southern literary messenger and he afterward boarded at the same hotel as herself but she saw most of him on his visit to richmond previous to his last he was then at her house daily and sometimes two or three times a day he came there as he said to rest if there happened to be friends present he was often obliging enough to read and would sometimes read some of his own poems but he would never read the raven unless he felt in the mood for it when in richmond he generally stayed with the mackenzies at duncan lodge and would drive in with them at any time one day he came in with his sister and two of the mackenzies and stopped with me there were some other people present and he read the raven for us he shut out the daylight and read by an astral lamp on the table when he was through all of us that had any tact whatever spared our comments and let our thanks be brief for he was most impatient of both of poe's reading mrs clark spoke with enthusiasm it was altogether peculiar and indescribable she said i have heard the raven read by his friend john r thompson and others but it sounded so strange and affected compared with his own delivery poe had a wonderful voice rich mellow and sweet i cannot give you any idea of it edwin booth sometimes reminds me of him in his eyes and expression but poe's voice was peculiar to himself i have never heard anything like it he often read from shelley and other poets one day he pointed out to me in one of shelley's poems what he considered the truest characteristic of hopeless love that he knew of the desire of the moth for the star of the night for the morrow i enjoyed a good deal of his society during that visit in eighteen forty seven on his last visit i saw less of him he was then said to be engaged to a mrs shelton some said he was marrying her for her money there was a good deal of gossip at that time concerning poe his intemperate habits especially were exaggerated and made the most of by those who did not like him while his companions in dissipation escaped unnoticed when he was in company at a party for instance you might see a little of him in the earlier part of the evening but he would presently be off somewhere then his eccentricities i think that when a very young man he imitated byron mrs clark said she had seldom seen a good likeness of poe the best she had cut from an old magazine this engraving she said showing it reflects at once the fastidiousness and the virility characteristic of his temperament all the others have an expression pitiably weak his worst calumniators could hardly desire for him a harder fate than the continual reproduction of that feeble visage when he had money he was lavish and over generous with it he was always refined you felt it in his very presence and as long as i knew him and as much as i was with him i never saw him in the least intoxicated i have seen him when he had had enough wine to make him talk with even more than his usual brilliancy indeed to talk in a large general company some little stimulant was necessary to him dr griswold says he was arrogant dogmatic and impatient of contradiction i have heard him engage in discussions frequently oftenest with diffidence always with consideration for others in a large company it was only when exhilarated with wine that he spoke out his views and ideas with any degree of self-assertion mrs clark said that his sister rosalie was rather pretty and resembled himself somewhat in appearance but was as different as possible in mental capacity she was amiable patient and sweet-tempered but as a companion wholly tiresome and monotonous she seemed to have had little or no individuality or force of character she thought a great deal of her brother but during the greater part of their lives they had seen nothing of each other 
the family of mr mackenzie treated her affectionately and kindly and until the breaking up of the household she remained with them and then went to baltimore with her relatives the poes i don't know what became of her afterwards mrs clark speaks of poe's reading and lectures during his first visit to richmond but these were mere small social entertainments at the houses of various acquaintances he really gave but one public lecture during this visit to richmond one evening at mrs mackenzie's she said to him edgar since people appear so eager to hear you repeat the raven why not give a public recital which might benefit you financially being further urged he finally yielded one hundred tickets were advertised at fifty cents each and the music hall of the fashionable exchange hotel engaged for the occasion on the appointed evening poe stepped upon the platform to face an audience of thirteen persons including the janitor and several to whom complimentary tickets had been presented of these was mrs shelton who occupied a seat directly in front of the platform poe was cool and self-possessed but his delivery mechanical and rather hurried and on concluding he bowed and abruptly retired one of the audience remarked upon the unlucky number of thirteen and mrs julia mayo cabell commented indignantly upon the indifference of the richmond people to their own great poet poe was undoubtedly in a degree mortified not at the indifference manifested but at the picture presented by the large and brilliantly lighted hall and himself addressing the group of thirteen which constituted the audience but his failure may be explained by the fact that in this month of august the elite and educated people of the city were mostly absent in the mountains and by the seashore and the weather being extremely sultry few were inclined to exchange the cool breezes of the city of the seven hills for a crowded and heated lecture-room even to hear the raven read by its author during this visit of poe to richmond i with my mother and sister was away from home in the mountains and we thus missed seeing him on our return shortly after his departure we heard various anecdotes concerning him one or two of which i subjoin as illustrative of his natural disposition one evening quite late an alarm of fire was raised and all the young men of duncan lodge accompanied by poe hastened to the scene of disaster about a mile further in the country finding a great crowd collected and that their services were not required they sat on a fence looking on and it was past midnight when they thought of returning home gay young dr tom mackenzie remarked that it would never do to return in their immaculate white linen suits as they would be sure to get a wigging from the old ladies for not having helped to put out the fire and besides they were all hungry and he knew how they could get a good supper with that he seized a piece of charred wood and commenced besmirching their white garments in their hands and faces including poe's arriving at home in an apparently exhausted condition they were treated by mrs mackenzie herself who would not disturb her servants to the best that the pantry afforded nor was the trick discovered until the following day mrs mackenzie laughed but for mrs carter the mother of two of the culprits and who was gifted with eloquence they got the wigging which they had been anxious to avoid and from all accounts poe enjoyed it all immensely a lady told me that one evening going over to duncan lodge her attention was attracted by the sound of voices in the garden where she beheld all the young men in the broad central alley engaged in the classic game of leapfrog when it came to mr poe's turn she said he took a swift run and skimmed over their backs like a bird seeming hardly to touch the ground i never saw the like mr jones mrs mackenzie's son-in-law who was rather large and heavy came to grief in his performance and no one laughed more heartily than did poe was this the melancholy morbid weird and wholly incomprehensible being that the world has pictured the author of the raven among these youthful spirits and his old friends the depressing influences of his late life and home 
the poverty the friendlessness seemed to vanish and his real disposition asserted itself pity that it could not have been always so i am convinced that a great deal of poe's unhappiness and apparent reserve and solitariness was owing to his obscure home life which kept him apart from all genial social influences at the north wherever seen out of his business hours he appears to have been alone and solitary proud and melancholy looking says one who had no idea of the loneliness of spirit the lack of genial companionship which made him so with a few he was on friendly terms but of intimate friends or associates he had not one so far as is known of the mackenzies so closely associated with poe during his lifetime i may be allowed to say that a more attractive family group i have rarely known beside those i have mentioned were the two youngest members mr dick and matty or matt wayward generous warm-hearted matt indifferent to people's opinion and heedless of conventionalities she cared for nothing so much as her horse and dog and spent an hour each day in the stables while her aunt miss jane would exclaim in despair i don't know what to do with martha i cannot make a lady of her to which she would answer with the satisfied assurance that nature had never intended her to be a lady but about this time in october matt was married there are ladies living who have heard from their mothers at that time young girls accounts of this famous wedding the festivities were kept up for full two weeks with ever-changing house parties and each evening music and dancing with unbounded hospitality miss jane mackenzie upon whom the family chiefly depended and whose fortune they expected to inherit was gone on a visit to her brother in london but she had given matt a liberal sum wherewith to celebrate her wedding sadly my thoughts pass from this gay time over the next ten years or so to the time of the war and the changes which it brought to this family and to us all end of chapter twenty five Chapter Twenty Six of the Home Life of Poe by Susan Archer Weiss. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mrs. Whitman. Poe was still in Richmond, presumably courting the widow Shelton, though in so quiet a manner that it attracted little or no attention, when he unexpectedly received from Mrs. Whitman, who seems to have repented of her silence a letter or poem of so encouraging a nature that he immediately left richmond and proceeded to new york here he obtained a letter of introduction to mrs whitman which he on the following day presented to that lady at her home in providence the next evening he spent in her company and on the succeeding day asked her to marry him receiving no definite answer he on his return to new york sent her a letter in which alluding to his previous intention of addressing mrs shelton he says your letter reached me on the very day on which i was about to enter upon a course which would have borne me far away from you sweet sweet helen and the divine dream of your love a few weeks later when he had obtained from her a conditional promise of marriage he again wrote a letter in which he clearly alludes to his still cherished design of establishing the stylus from which he anticipates such brilliant results thus he artfully and apparently for the first time seeks to interest her in the scheme am i right dearest helen in the impression that you are ambitious if so and if you will have faith in me i can and will satisfy your wildest desires it would be a glorious triumph for us darling for you and me to establish in america the sole unquestionable aristocracy that of the intellect to secure its supremacy to lead and control it all this i can do helen and will if you bid me and aid me 
aware of her belief in occult and spiritual influences he tells her that once on hearing a lady repeat certain utterances of hers which appeared but the secret reflex of his own spirit his soul seemed suddenly to become one with hers from that hour i loved you i have never seen or heard your name without a shiver half of delight half of anxiety the impression left upon my mind was that you were still a wife no such scruple had disturbed him in the case of mrs osgood and others he goes on thus artfully to explain the incident of his declining mrs osgood's offer of an introduction to mrs whitman while in providence for this reason i shunned your presence you may remember that once when i passed through providence with mrs osgood i positively refused to accompany her to your house i dared neither go or say why i could not i dared not speak of you much less see you for years your name never passed my lips while my soul drank in with a delirious thirst all that was uttered in my presence respecting you it will be observed that he is here speaking of a time when his wife whom he loved as man never before loved was yet living and also when he was giving himself up to his unreasoning passion for mrs osgood whom he had followed to providence after this who shall undertake to defend poe from the charge of insincerity and dissimulation mrs osgood calls poe's letters divinely beautiful we cannot tell how mrs whitman was affected by them but certainly her whole course exhibits her in a constant struggle between her own inclination and the influence of friends who desire to save her from the match with poe as early as january twenty first eighteen forty eight it was known to the public that an engagement existed between the two and i have the authority of mrs kellogg for the statement that during the summer of that year mrs whitman three times renewed this engagement and was as often compelled to break it owing to his unfortunate habits the last engagement was made on his solemnly vowing reformation on which a day was fixed for the marriage and the services of a clergyman bespoken by poe himself who thereupon wrote to mrs clem desiring her to be ready to receive himself and his bride at fordham one may imagine the dismay of poor mrs clem when she read this letter and looked around the humble home with its low-ceiled upstairs room which had been virginia's the pine kitchen table and her dozen pieces of crockery for once her strong mind and resourceful talent must have failed her how was she to accommodate the fastidious bride of her most inconsiderate son-in-law how even provide a wedding repast against their arrival but happily she was spared the horror of such an experience for on the appointed day poe arrived at fordham alone though in a state of nervous excitement which necessitated days and even weeks of careful nursing on the part of his patient and long-suffering mother-in-law this final separation between the two for they never again met was caused by poe's intemperance at his hotel in providence on the day previous to that appointed for his marriage he had delivered a lecture which was enthusiastically applauded and on his return to the hotel he found himself surrounded by an admiring crowd whose hospitalities he at first resolutely declined but with his usual weakness of will finally yielded to of the stormy scene when on the following day mrs whitman finally and decisively refused to marry him she herself has given an account representing poe as alternately pleading and raving in his unwillingness to accept her decision but there can be no question but that he was at this time either in some degree mentally unbalanced or in such a state physically as that the least excess would serve to excite his mind beyond its normal condition and render him partly irresponsible of this we have proof in the fact of his intention of taking his proposed bride to fordham that mrs whitman was really interested in her gifted and eccentric suitor is evident 
and in her heart she was loyal to him as is shown by her defence of him after his death and also by the lines which she addressed to him some months after their separation entitled the isle of dreams most of her poems written after this time had some reference to him and it is worthy of note that no woman whom poe professed to love ever lost her interest in him the fascination which he exerted over them must have been something extraordinary as regards poe's feelings towards mrs whitman it is evident from the beginning that there was no real love on his part he expressed no regret at the ending of his divine dream of love but seems rather to have experienced toward her a degree of resentment which thus found expression in a letter to a friend from this day forth i shun the pestilential society of literary women they are a heartless unnatural venomous dishonourable set with no guiding principle but inordinate self-esteem mrs osgood is the only exception i know of this tirade was doubtless excited partly by a scandal just now started by one of the literary set in question concerning poe and a young married lady of lowell while delivering a lecture in that city he had been hospitably entertained at her home where he spent several days with the usual result of contracting a sentimental friendship with the charming hostess whom he calls annie during the latter part of his engagement to mrs whitman his visits and attentions to this lady did not escape the notice of the literary set and a scandal was at once started by one of them who drew the attention of annie's husband to the matter he accepted poe's explanation and his proposal rather to give up the society of these friends than to be the cause of trouble to them saying i cannot and will not have it upon my conscience that i have interfered with the domestic happiness of the only being on earth whom i have loved at the same time with purity and with truth certainly an extraordinary avowal to be made to the lady's husband and we ask ourselves to how many women had he made a similar declaration we have seen that when poe for the last time left mrs whitman's he went direct to fordham where said mrs clem he raved about annie and even sent to her reminding her of the holy promise which he had exacted from her in their hour of parting that she would come to him on his bed of death and now claiming the fulfilment of that promise whether or not she complied does not appear but it is more than likely that the lines for annie were suggested by his fevered dreams of her presence first written while still half delirious and subsequently slightly altered to their present form this piece with the lines to my mother after being declined by all the more prominent magazines finally appeared in the cheap boston weekly and must have been a surprise to annie and her husband but there was one woman of the literary set who showed that she at least was not deserving of the sweeping condemnation wherewith the irate poet had visited them this was mrs anna estelle lewis a young poetess who with her husband was on friendly terms with poe and whose poems he had favourably noticed poe was still mentally and physically in a state which rendered him incapable of writing and the condition at fordham was deplorable suspecting this state of things mrs lewis and her husband invited poe to visit them at their home in brooklyn and mrs lewis says that thenceforth they frequently had both himself and mrs clem to stay with them it was this kindly couple that r h stoddard so sharply satirizes in his reminiscences of poe while accepting an evening's hospitality at their home after the poet's death on this occasion he met with mrs clem of whom he has given a pen picture of which we instinctively recognize the life likeness we can see the good lady seated serenely among the company in her black bombazine and conventional widow's cap lightly fingering her eyeglasses as was her company habit and with her strongly marked features wearing that benevolent smile which was characteristic of her most amiable moods she assured me says stoddard that she had often heard her eddie speak of me which i doubted and that she believed she had also heard him speak of the stripling by my side which was an impossibility 
she regretted that she had no more autographs to dispose of but hinted that she could manufacture them since she could exactly imitate her eddie's handwriting and this she told as though it had been to her credit deeply chagrined at the ending of his affair with mrs whitman and consequent disappointment in regard to the stylus poe now encouraged by his mother-in-law again turned his thoughts to mrs shelton it was in july that he and mrs clem left fordham he to proceed to richmond and she having let their rooms until his return to stay with the lewises mr lewis says that it was at his front door that poe took an affectionate leave of them all mrs clem ever watchful and careful against possible temptation or pitfalls by the way accompanying him to the boat to see him off in parting from her he spoke cheeringly and affectionately god bless you my own darling muddy do not fear for eddie see how good i will be while away and i will come back to love and comfort you and so smiling and hopeful the devoted mother stood upon the pier and watched to the last the receding form which she was never again to behold end of chapter twenty six Chapter Twenty Seven of the Home Life of Poe by Susan Archer Weiss. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Again in Richmond. When Poe came to Richmond on this visit, he went first to Duncan Lodge, but afterward, for the sake of the convenience of being in the city, took board at the old Swan Tavern on Broad Street, once a fashionable hostelry, but at this time little more than a cheap though respectable boarding house for business men broad street so named from its unusual width extended several miles in a straight line from chinborazo heights and church hill on the east where mrs shelton had her residence to the western suburbs where duncan lodge and our own home of talavera were situated this was the route which poe traversed in his visits to mrs shelton there were no street cars in those days hacks were expensive and the walk from the swan to church hill was long and fatiguing poe would break his journey by stopping to rest at the office of dr john carter a young physician who had recently hung out his sign about halfway between those two points during the three months of his stay in richmond we saw a good deal of poe he appeared at first to be in not very good health or spirits but soon brightened up and was invariably cheerful seeming to be enjoying himself i do not know to what it was to be attributed unless to his increased fame as a poet but certainly his reception in richmond at this time was very different from what it had been two years previously he became the fashion and was feted in society and discussed in the papers his friend mrs julia mayo cabell a first cousin of mrs allen inaugurated the evening entertainments to which people were invited to meet mr poe it was generally expected that at these gatherings he would recite the raven and this he was often obliging enough to do though we knew that it was to him an unwelcome task in our own home no matter who were the visitors we would never allow this request to be made of him after he had on one occasion gratified us by a recital i remember on this occasion being disappointed in his manner of delivery i had expected some little graceful and expressive action but he sat motionless as a statue except that at the line prophet cried i thing of evil he slightly erected his head and again in repeating get thee back into the tempest and the night's plutonian shore he turned his face suddenly though slightly toward the outer darkness of the open window near which he sat each time raising his voice he explained his own idea to be that any action served to attract the attention of the audience from the poem to the speaker thus detracting from the effect of the former i was told how at one of these entertainments poe was embarrassed by the persistent attentions of a moth or beetle until a sympathetic old lady took a seat beside him and with wild wavings of a huge fan kept the troublesome insect at a distance this mingling of the comic with the tragic element rather spoiled the effect of the latter 
and though poe preserved his dignity he was perceptibly annoyed i never saw mr poe in a large company but was told that on such occasions he invariably assumed his mask of cold and proud reserve not untouched by an expression of sadness which was natural to his features when in repose it was then that he looked every inch a poet in general companies he disliked any attempt to draw him out never expressing himself freely and at times manifesting a shyness amounting almost to an appearance of diffidence which was very noticeable a marked peculiarity was that he never while in richmond either in society or elsewhere made any advance to acquaintance or sought an introduction even to a lady aware of the estimation in which his character was held by some persons he stood aloof in proud independence though responding with ready courtesy to any advance from others ladies who desired mr poe's acquaintance would be compelled to privately seek an introduction from some friend since he himself never requested it and it was observed that he preferred the society of mature women to that of the youthful belles who were enthusiastic over the author of lenore and the raven mr poe spent his mornings in town but in the evenings would generally drive out to duncan lodge with some of the mackenzies he liked the half-country neighborhood and would sometimes join us in our sunset rambles in the romantic old hermitage grounds those were pleasant evenings at duncan lodge and talavera with no lack of company at either place End of chapter twenty seven Chapter twenty eight of the Home Life of Poe by Susan Archer Weiss. The Sleepervox recording is in the public domain. A Morning with Poe and the Raven. A Leaf from a Journal. One pleasant, though slightly drizzly morning in the latter part of September, I sat in our parlor at Talavera at a table on which were some new magazines and a vase of tea roses freshly gathered. Opposite me sat Mr. Poe. A basket of grapes, his favorite fruit, had been placed between us, and as we leisurely partook of them we chatted lightly. He inquired at length what method I pursued in my writing. The idea was new to me, and on my replying that I wrote only on the impulse of a newly conceived idea, he proceeded to give me some needed advice. I must make a study of my poem, he said, line by line and word by word, and revise and correct it until it was as perfect as it could be made it was in this way that he himself wrote and then he spoke of the raven he had before told me of the difficulties which he had experienced in writing this poem and of how it had lain for more than ten years in his desk unfinished while he would at long intervals work on it adding a few words or lines altering omitting and even changing the plan or idea of the poem in the endeavor to make of it something which would satisfy himself his first intention he said had been to write a short poem only based upon the incident of an owl a night bird the bird of wisdom with its ghostly presence and inscrutable gaze entering the window of a vault or chamber where he sat beside the bier of the lost lenore then he had exchanged the owl for the raven for the sake of the latter's nevermore and the poem despite himself had grown beyond the length originally intended does this not explain why the raven though not like the owl a night bird should be represented as attracted by the lighted window and perching upon the bust of pallas which would be more appropriate to the original owl minerva's bird also we recognize the latter in the lines by the grave and stern decorum of the countenance at war poe in adopting the raven evidently did not obliterate all traces of the owl of these troubles with the poem he had before informed me and now in answer to a remark of mine he said in effect the raven was never completed it was published before i had given the final touches there were in it certain knotty points and tangles which i had never been able to overcome and i let it go as it was 
he told how toward the last he had become heartily tired of and disgusted with the poem of which he had so poor an opinion that he was many times on the point of destroying it i believe that his having published it under the nom de plume of quarles was owing to this lack of confidence in it and that had it proven a failure he would never have acknowledged himself the author he feared to risk his literary reputation on what appeared to him of such uncertain merit he now in speaking of the poem regretted that he had not fully completed before publishing it if i had a copy of it here he said i could show you those naughty points of which i spoke and which i have found it impossible to do away with adding perhaps you will help me i am sure that you can if you will i did not feel particularly flattered by this proposal knowing that since his coming to richmond he had made a similar request of at least two other persons however i cleared the table of the fruit and the flowers and placed before him several sheets of generous foolscap on which i had copied for a friend the raven as it was first published he requested me to read it aloud and as i did so slowly and carefully he sat pencil in hand ready to mark the difficult passages of which he had spoken i paused at the third line had i not myself often noted the incongruity of representing the poet as pondering over many a volume instead of a single one i glanced inquiringly at poe and noting his unconscious look proceeded when i reached the line and each separate dying ember wrought its ghost upon the floor he gave a slight shiver or shrug of the shoulders an expressive motion habitual to him and the pencil came down with an emphatic stroke beneath the six last words this was one of the hardest knots he said nor could he find a way of getting over it ember was the only word rhyming with the two preceding lines but in no way could he dispose of it except as he had done thus producing the worst line in the poem we pondered over it for a while and finally gave it up but i may here mention that i have since in studying the poem made a discovery which strangely enough seems never to have occurred to the author this was that in this particular stanza he had unconsciously reversed the order or arrangement of the lines placing those of the triple rhymes first and the rhyming couplet last thus all his long years of worry over that unfortunate ember had been unnecessary since the construction of the verse required not only the omission of the word as a rhyme but of the whole line of and each separate dying ember when the succeeding objectionable words wrought its ghost upon the floor could have been easily altered and the addition of a third line to the succeeding couplet would have made the stanza correct our next pause was at the word beast through which he ran his pencil bird or beast upon the sculptured bust above my chamber door i must get rid of that word he said for of course no beast could be expected to occupy such a position oh yes a mouse for instance i suggested at which he gave me one of his rare humorous smiles leaving this point for future consideration we passed on to a more serious difficulty this and more i sat divining with my head at ease reclining on the cushion's velvet lining with the lamplight gloated o'er the naughty point here was in the word lining a blunder obvious to every reader poe said that the only way he could see of getting over the difficulty was by omitting the whole stanza but he was unwilling to give up that violet velvet chair which with the purple silken curtain he considered a picturesque adjunct to the scene imparting to it a character of luxury which served as a relief to the more sombre surroundings i had so often heard this impossible lining criticized that when he inquired shall i omit or retain the stanza i ventured to suggest that it might be better to give up the stanza than have the poem marred by a defect so conspicuous for a moment he held the pencil poised as if in doubt and i have since wondered what would have been his decision 
but just here we were interrupted by the tumultuous entrance of my little dog pink in hot pursuit of the family cat the latter took refuge beneath the table at which we were seated and there ensued a brisk exchange of dualistic passes until i called off pink and mr poe took up the cat and placing her on his knee stroked her soothingly inquiring if she were my pet upon my disclaiming any partiality for felines he said i like them and continued his gentle caressing was he thinking of catalina his wife's pet cat which he had left at home in fordham and which after her death had sat upon his shoulder as he wrote far into the night recalling his grave and softened expression i think that it must have been so but at that time i had never heard of catalina but now came the final and most difficult tangle of all the blunder apparent to the world the defect which mars the whole poem and yet is contained in but a single line and the lamplight o'er him streaming casts his shadow on the floor poe declared this to be hopeless and that it was in fact the chief cause of his dissatisfaction with the poem indeed it may well excite surprise that he so careful and fastidious as to the completeness of his work should have allowed the raven to go from his hands marred by a defect so glaring but this is proof that he did indeed regard it as hopeless when mr poe left us on this september morning he took with him this manuscript copy of the raven which however he on the following day handed to me begging that i would keep it until his return from new york i found that he had marked several minor defects in the poem one of which was his objection to the word shutter as being too commonplace and not agreeing with the word lattice previously used he remarked before leaving for new york that he intended having the raven after some further work upon it published in an early number of the stylus i do not doubt but that had he lived he would have made it much more perfect than it now is after his death his friend mr robert sully the richmond artist was desirous of making a picture of the raven but explained to me why it could not be done all on account of that impossible shadow on the floor of course said he to produce such an effect the lamplight must come from above and behind the bust and the bird no it was impracticable this set me to thinking and the result was that i some time after went to mr sully's studio and said to him how would it do to have a glass transom above the door one of those large fan-shaped transoms which we sometimes find in old colonial mansions opening on a lofty galleried hall it would do he said indeed with such an arrangement and the lamp supposed to be suspended from the hall ceiling as in those old mansions there would be no difficulty with either the poem or the picture and we were both delighted at our discovery and thought how pleased poe would have been with the idea so effective in explaining that mysterious shadow on the floor mr sully commenced upon his picture but died before completing it this manuscript copy of the raven with all its pencil marks as made by mr poe on that september morning remained in my possession for many years it is yet photographed upon my memory with all the details here given from an odd leaf of a journal which i kept about that time the quiet parlour the outside drizzle the books the roses the face and figure of mr poe as he gravely bent over that manuscript copy of his immortal poem of the raven had he no premonition that even then a darker shadow than that of the raven was hovering over him it was one of the last occasions on which i ever saw him End of chapter twenty eight Chapter Twenty Nine of the Home Life of Poe by Susan Archer Weiss. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mrs. Shelton. Poe's first visits on his arrival in Richmond had been to Mrs. Shelton, and it soon became known that an engagement existed between them. 
although they were never seen together in public and poe on all occasions denied the engagement yet morning after morning the curious neighbors were treated to a sight of the poet ascending the steps of the tall plain substantial-looking brick house on the corner of grace street facing the rear of st john's church and had they watched more closely they might at times have seen another figure following in its footsteps this was rosalie poe who delighted at her brother's engagement and being utterly without tact or judgment would present herself at mrs shelton's door shortly after his own arrival as she said for the pleasure of seeing the couple together once she surprised them at a tete-a-tete luncheon at which corned beef and mustard figured but on another occasion mrs shelton met and informed her that mr poe had a headache from his long walk and was resting on the parlor sofa where she herself would attend to him and so dismissed her to her great indignation not alone to mrs shelton's were these shadowings of her brother confined but if she at any time knew of his intention to call at some house where she herself was acquainted she was as likely as not make her own appearance during his visit or in promenading broad street he would unexpectedly find himself waylaid and introduced to some prosy acquaintance of his sister it required mrs mackenzie's authority to relieve him from these annoyances there was however something pathetic in the sister's pride in and affection for a brother from whom she received but little manifestation of regard he treated her indulgently but as she herself often said in her homely way edgar could never love me as i do him because he is so far above me about the middle of august mrs shelton's interested neighbors observed that the poet's visits to her suddenly ceased and then followed a report that the engagement was broken and that a bitter estrangement existed between the two mr woodbury poe's biographer doubts this and declares that we have no evidence that such was the case but we who were on the spot as it were and had opportunity of judging knew that the report was true miss van Lu, the famous war postmistress of richmond once said to me as standing on the porch of her house she pointed out mrs shelton's residence i used at first to often see mr poe enter there but never during the latter part of his stay in richmond it seemed to be known about here that the engagement was off gossip had it that mrs shelton discarded him because persuaded by friends that he was after her money all her relatives are said to be opposed to the match from poe's own confidential statement to mr john mackenzie who had first suggested the match with mrs shelton it appears that money considerations was really the cause of the trouble mrs shelton had the reputation of being a thorough business woman and very careful and cautious with regard to her money poe was at this time canvassing in the interests of the stylus in which he received great encouragement from his friends but when he applied to mrs shelton it is certain that she failed to respond as he desired she had no faith in the success of his plan neither any sympathy with its purpose also in discussing arrangements for their marriage she announced her intention of keeping entire control of her property poe himself broke their engagement next there arose a difficulty concerning certain letters which the lady desired to have returned to her and which he declined to give up except on condition of receiving his own possibly each feared that these letters might some time fall into the hands of poe's biographers if they were written during his courtship of mrs whitman and when still uncertain of the result he appears to have been keeping mrs shelton in reserve mrs shelton during a few days absence of poe at the country home of mr john mackenzie came to duncan lodge and appealed to mrs mackenzie to influence poe in returning her letters i saw her on this occasion a tall rather masculine-looking woman who drew her veil over her face as she passed us on the porch though i caught a glimpse of large shadowy light-blue eyes which must once have been handsome 
we heard no more of her until some time about the middle of september when suddenly poe's visits to her were resumed though in a very quiet manner it seems certain that the engagement was then renewed and that mrs shelton must have promised to assist poe in his literary enterprise for from that time he was enthusiastic in regard to the stylus and what he termed its assured success he even commenced arranging a table of contents for the first number of the magazine and mrs mackenzie told me how he one morning spent an hour in her room taking from her information notes and data for an article which he intended to appear in one of its earliest numbers he was in high spirits and declared that he had never felt in better health this was after an attack of serious illness due to his association with dissipated companions tempted as he was on every side and wherever he went in the city it was not strange that he had not always the strength of will to resist and twice during this visit to richmond he was subject to attacks somewhat similar to those which he had known at fordham and through which he was now kindly nursed by his friends at duncan lodge poe gave but one public lecture on this visit to richmond that on the poetic principle and of this most exaggerated accounts have been given by several writers even to the present day they representing it to have been a great financial success one recent lecturer remarks upon the strangeness of the fate when just as the hitherto impecunious poet was about returning home with five thousand and five hundred dollars in his pocket he should have been robbed of it all the truth of the matter is that but two hundred and fifty tickets were printed the price being fifty cents each and as dr william gibbon carter informed me there were by actual count not more than one hundred persons present at the lecture some being holders of complimentary tickets another account says there were but sixty present but that they were of the very elite of the city considering that from the proceeds of the lecture all expenses of hall rent had to be paid we cannot wonder at poe's writing to mrs clem my poor poor muddy i am yet unable to send you a single dollar i was present at this lecture with my mother and sister and rose poe who as we took seats reserved for us left her party and joined us i noticed that poe had no manuscript and that though he stood like a statue he held his audience as motionless as himself fascinated by his voice and expression rose pointed out to me mrs shelton seated conspicuously in front of the platform facing the lecturer this position gave me a good view of her with her large deep-set light blue eyes and sunken cheeks her straight features high forehead and cold expression of countenance doubtless she had been handsome in her youth but the impression which she produced upon me was that of a sensible practical woman the reverse of a poet's ideal and yet she says poe often told her that she was the original of his lost lenore when poe had concluded his lecture he lightly and quickly descended the platform and passing mrs shelton without notice came to where we were seated greeting us in his usual graceful manner he looked pleased smiling and handsome the audience arose but made no motion to retire watching him as he talked and evidently waiting to speak to him but he never glanced in their direction rose radiantly happy stood drawn up to her full height and observed edgar only see how the people are staring at the poet and his sister i believe it to have been the proudest moment of her life and one which she ever delighted to recall this occurred during the period of estrangement between poe and mrs shelton quite suddenly in the latter part of september poe decided to go to new york his object was as he himself declared to make some arrangements in regard to the stylus though gossip said to bring mrs clem on to his marriage it is difficult to get a clear idea of the relation between poe and mrs shelton owing to the contradictory statements of the two 
undoubtedly they must have met during poe's first visit to richmond and he tells mrs whitman that he was about to address the lady when her own letters caused him to change his mind and yet mrs shelton speaks of their meeting on his last visit as though it had been the first since their youthful acquaintance as she entered the parlor she says on his first call i knew him at once and as the pious and practical woman that she was she adds i told him that i was on my way to church and that i allowed nothing to interfere with this duty she says also in her reminiscences i was never engaged to him but there was an understanding and yet on his death she appeared in public attired in deep widow's weeds that she was devoted to him appears from her own letter to dr moran when informed by him of poe's death he was dearer to me than any other living creature poe himself writing to mrs clem says elmira has just returned from the country i believe that she loves me more devotedly than any one i ever knew he adds apparently in allusion to his marriage nothing has yet been arranged and it will not do to hurry matters concluding with if possible i will get married before leaving richmond on his deathbed in washington he said to dr moran sir i was to have been married in ten days and requested him to write to mrs shelton end of chapter twenty nine chapter thirty of the home life of poe by susan archer weiss this librivox recording is in the public domain the mystery of fate one evening it was sunday the second of october dr john carter was seated alone in his office when poe entered having just paid a farewell visit to mrs shelton before leaving in the morning for new york he remarked to dr carter that he would probably stop for one day in baltimore and perhaps also in philadelphia on business would like to remain longer but had written to mrs clem to expect him at fordham some time this week he would be back in richmond in about a fortnight while talking he took up a handsome malacca sword cane belonging to dr carter and absently played with it he looked grave and preoccupied several times inquired the hour and at length rising suddenly remarked that he would step over to sadler's restaurant and get supper he took the cane with him dr carter understanding from this circumstance and his not taking leave that he would presently return on his way to the swan where he had left his baggage he did not however reappear and on the next morning dr carter inquired about him at sadler's the proprietor said that poe and two friends had remained to a late hour talking and drinking moderately and had then left together to go aboard the boat which would start at four o'clock for baltimore he said that poe when he left was in good spirits and quite sober though this last may be doubted since he not only forgot to return dr carter's cane but to send for his own baggage at the swan some persons have insisted that poe must have been drugged by these men who were strangers to mr sadler and there was even a sensational story published in a northern magazine to the effect that poe had been followed to baltimore by two of mrs shelton's brothers and there after having certain letters taken from him beaten so severely that he was found dying in an obscure alley this story was first started by mrs elizabeth oak smith in one of the new york journals though it does not appear from what source she derived her information no denial was made or notice taken of it by mrs shelton's friends and the story gradually died out for over forty years the mystery of the tragic death of the poet remained a mystery strangely and persistently defying all attempts at elucidation but within the last few years there has appeared in a st louis paper a communication which professes to give a truthful account of the circumstances connected with the poet's death and which wears such an appearance of probability that it is at least worth considering this letter which is addressed to the editor of the paper is from a certain dr snodgrass who represents himself to have been for many years a resident of dakota 
he says that on the evening of october second eighteen forty nine being in baltimore he stepped into a plain but respectable eating-house or restaurant kept by an irish widow where to his surprise he met with poe whom he had once been accustomed to meet here but had not seen for some years after taking some refreshment they left the place together but had not proceeded far when they were seized upon by two men who hurried them off to some place where they were with several others kept close prisoners through the night and following day though otherwise well treated it was the eve of a great municipal election and the city was wild with excitement next evening the kidnappers having drugged their captives hurried them to the polls where they in a half-conscious condition were made to vote over and over again the doctor it appears was only partially affected but poe succumbed utterly and at length one of the men said what is the use of dragging around a dead man with that they called a hack put poe within it and ordered the driver to take him to the washington hospital dr snodgrass says positively i myself saw poe thrust into the hack heard the order given and saw the vehicle drive off with its unconscious burden thus if this account may be relied upon ended the strange sad tragedy of the poet's life none stranger none sadder in all the annals of modern literature dr snodgrass intimates that his reason for so long a delay in making this story known was his unwillingness to have his own part in the affair exposed and with the notoriety which its connection with the poet would render unavoidable but now he says in his old age and having outlived all who knew him at the time this consideration is of little worth to him if the story not be true we cannot see why it should have been invented at least it cannot at the present day be disproved and it certainly appears to be the most probable and natural explanation of the poet's death that has been given it agrees also with dr moran's account of poe's condition when he was received at the hospital and with the latter's earnest assurance that he himself was not responsible for that condition and also with his requesting that dr snodgrass be sent for the kidnappers had probably exchanged his garments for others as a means of disguise intending to restore them eventually they at least did not take from him the handsome malika cane which was in his grasp when he reached the hospital and which would tend to prove that he was not then altogether unconscious this cane was at dr carter's request returned to him by mrs clem to whom dr moran sent it his baggage left at the swan was sent by mr mackenzie to mrs clem disproving the story that it had been stolen from him in baltimore in addition to the above we find another and very similar account apparently by the same dr snodgrass in the san francisco chronicle of august thirty first the date of the year not appearing on the clipping from which i make the following extracts you say that poe did not die from the effects of deliberate dissipation asked the chronicle reporter that is just what i do mean and i say further that he died from the effects of deliberate murder the author of this assertion was a well-known member of this city's advanced and inveterate bohemia a gentleman who has long since retired from the active pursuits of his profession and spends his old age in dreamy meditation frequenting one of the popular resorts of the craft but mingling little in their society when joining in their conversation it is generally to correct some errors from his inexhaustible mine of reminiscences and on these occasions his words are few and precise then you knew something of the poet doctor i was his intimate associate for years much that biographers have said of him is false especially regarding his death poe was not an habitual drunkard but he was a steady drinker when his means admitted of it his habitual resort when in baltimore was the widow meagre's place on the city front 
inexpensive but respectable having an oyster and liquor stand and corresponding in some respects with the coffee shops of san francisco here i frequently met him but about his death the mystery of the poet's death had remained a mystery for more than forty years when there appeared in a texas paper an article from the pen of the editor in which he gave a letter from a dr snodgrass professing to reveal the truth of the matter about the time that this article was published there appeared one in the san francisco chronicle by a reporter of that paper telling of an interview which he had had with the same dr snodgrass of whom he says he was a well-known literary bohemian of this city who long ago gave up his profession and is spending his old age in a state of dreamy existence from which he is seldom aroused except to correct some error concerning people and things of past times of which he possesses a mine of reminiscences the doctor denying that poe had died from dissipation gave an account of the manner of his death as he knew it corresponding in all particulars with that given by him to the texas editor in conclusion he said poe did not die of dissipation i say that he was deliberately murdered he died of laudanum or some other drug forced upon him by his kidnappers when one said what is the use of carrying around a dying man they put him in a cab and sent him to the hospital i was there and saw it myself poe had been shifting about between baltimore philadelphia and new york for some years once he had been away for several months in richmond and one evening turned up at the widow's i was there when he came in then it was drinks all round and at length we were real jolly it was the eve of an election and we started up town there were four of us and we had not gone half a dozen squares when we were nabbed by policemen who were looking up voters to coop it was the practice in those days to seize people whether drunk or sober and keep them locked up until the polls were opened and then march them to every precinct in control of the party having the coop this coop was in the rear of an engine house on calvert street it was part of the plan to stupefy the prisoners with drugged liquor next day we were voted at thirty different places it being as much as one's life was worth to rebel poe was so badly drugged that he had to be carried on two or three rounds and then the gang said it was no use trying any longer to vote a dead man and must get rid of him and with that they shoved him into a cab and sent him away then he died from dissipation after all nothing of the kind he died from the effects of laudanum or some other poison forced on him in the coop he was in a dying condition when being voted twenty or thirty times the story told by griswold and others of his being picked up in the street is a lie i saw him thrust into the cab myself and mrs clem when she received poe's letter bidding her to expect him at fordham that week she hastened thither to set her house in order for his reception day after day she watched and waited but he did not come and at length when the week had passed she one evening sat alone in the little cottage around which and through the naked branches of the cherry tree the october wind was sighing and in anguish of spirit wrote to annie eddie is dead dead end of chapter thirty Chapter Thirty One of the Home Life of Poe by Susan Archer Weiss. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. After the War. In the fall of eighteen sixty five, the year which saw the conclusion of the unhappy war, I returned to Richmond in my old home of Talavera, which I had not seen in four years. What a shock to me was the first sight of it! in place of the pleasant smiling home there stood a bare and lonely house in the midst of encircling fortifications still bristling with dismantled gun carriages every outbuilding had disappeared all the beautiful trees which had made it so attractive even the young cedar of lebanon which had been our pride were gone greenhouses orchard vineyard 
everything had been swept away leaving only a dead level overgrown with broom straw amidst which were scattered rusted bayonets and a few hardy plants struggling through the trampled ground the place was no longer talavera but battery ten in this desolate abode i remained for some time awaiting the arrival of our scattered family and with no protectors save a faithful old negro couple each evening we would barricade as well as we could the entrance to the fort as some slight protection against the hordes of newly freed negroes who roamed the country living on whatever they could pick up one evening when we had taken this precaution some one was heard calling without and mounting the ramparts i beheld a forlorn-looking figure in black standing upon the outer edge of the trench it proved to be rosalie poe and when i had brought her into the light and warmth of the fire i saw how changed and ill she appeared she told me of the mackenzies mrs mackenzie was dead matt mrs bird was a widow with a beautiful young daughter and her brother mr richard was in wretched health miss jane mackenzie had died in england leaving her fortune to her brother residing there and the destruction of the war had completed the poverty of the family they lived on a little place in the country with a cow and a garden as their chief means of support they have to work for a living now rose said forlornly but i am not strong enough to work i am going to baltimore to my relations there and see what they can do for me i inquired after young dr mackenzie gay handsome genial tom whom everyone loved tom is dead said rose sadly he died of camp fever and bad food when he came home he had only the clothes which he wore and a neighbor gave us something to bury him in with a pang i thought of the gay wedding at duncan lodge and the happy faces that had been there assembled when rose left me i could but hope that she would be kindly received by her relatives in baltimore but some months thereafter being in new york i received from her a number of photographs of her brother which she begged of me to dispose of for her benefit at one dollar each mrs m a kidder of boston kindly interested herself in the matter but wrote me that she met with but poor success even at the reduced price of twenty-five cents people saying that they had not sufficient respect for poe's character to care to possess his portrait i found it to be nearly the same in new york and meantime rose wrote me every few days dear s haven't you got anything for me yet do try and do something for me for i am worse off now than ever i walk about the streets all day trying to dispose of her brother's pictures and at night have to look for a place to sleep i feel like a lost sheep thus the sister of edgar a poe in the year eighteen sixty eight wandered homeless and friendless through the streets of baltimore as more than thirty years previous her brother had done we heard long afterward that through some kind northern lady she applied for admittance to the louise home in washington which mr corcoran was willing to grant but that certain of his guests ladies who had formerly occupied high social positions were of opinion that considering miss poe's eccentricities she would be better suited and better satisfied in a less pretentious establishment finally she was received into the epiphany church home in washington where she seems to have enjoyed a good deal of liberty being often seen riding on the street cars and visiting the offices of wealthy business men who if they did not care to possess a photograph of poe were yet willing to assist his penniless sister it was never known what she did with the money so collected but from a letter to mrs bird it would appear that her intention was to purchase a grave for herself near that of her brother mrs bird wrote to me i think poe's friends might lay rose in a grave beside him it has always been her dearest wish rosalie poe died suddenly with a letter in her hand but that moment received and which when opened proved to be from mr george w childs enclosing a check for fifty dollars doubtless in answer to an application for aid they gave her a pauper's grave in the cemetery of the epiphany church home 
the record of her death by the board is rosalie poe died june fourteen eighteen seventy four aged sixty four some years after the death of rose poe i received a visit from mrs bird whom i had not seen since the war and we talked over times past and present it had been rosalie's own choice she said to go to baltimore she did not like the country or the hard life which they were leading she must have collected considerable money but never told where she kept it nor was it ever found she told me about her family her pretty daughter had married a poor man in preference to a rich one who had offered and they had two beautiful babies and were very happy her brother richard was infirm and able to do but little work they had a little place in the country where they raised their own vegetables and sent poultry and eggs to market she and her son-in-law did all the hard work about the place i wash and cook for six persons said she cheerily yes she continued in her old quaint way we are poor but respectable and i am more content than ever i was at duncan lodge i feel that i have something to live for and the working life suits me yes we are happy although there are not two teacups in the house of the same pattern she spoke of poe whom she considered to have always been unjustly treated everybody could see what his faults were but few gave him credit for his good qualities his generous nature and kindly and affectionate disposition especially as exemplified in the harmony always existing between himself and his wife and mother-in-law while giving the latter full credit for her devotion to edgar her impression was that except in the matter of his dissipation her influence over him had not been for good her mother and brother john believed that the marriage with virginia had been the greatest misfortune of his life and that he himself while patiently resigning himself to his lot had come to regard it as such some ten years after the death of poe i received from mrs clem a letter giving a pathetic account of her homelessness and poverty but she added she had been offered a home with her relatives at the south and she appealed to me as a friend of her eddy to assist her in raising the money necessary to pay her expenses thither a similar appeal she made to other of poe's former friends but we heard of her afterward as an inmate of the church home infirmary in baltimore where she died in eighteen seventy one having outlived her son-in-law some twenty-two years it is a curious coincidence that the building in which she died was the same in which as the washington hospital poe had breathed his last her grave is in westminster cemetery and in sight of poe's monument End of chapter 31。Chapter 32 of The Home Life of Poe by Susan Archer Weiss。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain。Poe's Character。In order thoroughly to understand Poe, it is necessary that one should recognize the dominant trait of his character a trait which affected and in a measure overruled all the rest in a word weakness of will unstable as water is written upon poe's every visage in characters which all might read in the weak falling away of the outline of the jaw the narrow receding chin and the sensitive irresolute mouth above the soul-lighted eyes and the magnificent temple of intellect overshadowing them we look in vain for the rising dome of firmness which like the keystone of the arch should strengthen and bind together the rest lacking this the arch must be ever tottering to a fall to this weakness of will we may trace nearly every other defect in poe's character together with most of the disappointments and failures in whatsoever he undertook he lacked the resolution and persistence necessary to battle against obstacles to persevere to the end against opposition and discouragement and to resist temptations and influences which he knew would lead him astray from the object which he had at heart 
in this way he lost many a coveted prize when it seemed almost within his grasp the accepted opinion is that poe's dissipation was his chief fault as it was that to which was owing his ruin in the end but even this was the effect chiefly of weakness of will he was not by nature inclined to evil but the contrary and we have seen that when left to himself and not exposed to temptation he was from all accounts sober industrious and exemplary in his conduct but he lacked firmness to resist the temptation which more than in the case of most men assailed him on every side dr william gibbon carter has told me how when poe was in richmond on his last visit and doing his best to remain sober he would in his visits and strolls about the city be constantly greeted by friends and acquaintances with invitations to take a julep it was the custom of the time poe said dr carter in one morning declined twenty-four such invitations but finally yielded and the consequence was the severe illness which threatened his life whilst in the city the effect of one glass on him said the doctor was that of several on any other man often he was tempted to drink from an amiable reluctance to decline the offered hospitality a marked peculiarity of poe's character was the restless discontent which from his sixteenth year took possession of and clung to him through life and was to him a source of much unhappiness it was not the discontent of poverty or of ungratified worldly ambition but the dissatisfaction of a genius which knows itself capable of higher things from which it is disbarred the desire of the caged eagle for the wind-swept sky and the distant eyrie he was not satisfied with being a mere writer of stories he believed that with a broader scope he could wield a powerful influence over the literary world and make a record for strength brilliancy and originality of thought which would render his name famous in other countries as in this his desire was to set established rules and conventionalities at defiance and to be fearless independent dominant in his assertion of himself and his ideas and convictions as an editor writing for other editors he found himself trammelled by what he called their narrowness and timidity he must be his own master his own editor and hence his lifelong dream and desire took form in the conception of the stylus that ignis fatuus which he pursued to the last day of his life uncertain elusive yet ever eagerly sought and always ending in disappointment and bitterness of soul time and again it seemed within his grasp and as he exultantly proclaimed his prospects glorious when by his own weakness of will it was lost to him undoubtedly one of the chief factors in the non-success of poe's life and its consequent unhappiness was his marriage setting aside the poetic imaginings which have been and doubtless will continue to be written concerning this marriage as one of idyllic mutual love and idolatry the story in the light of established facts resolves itself into a very prosaic one mr john mackenzie poe's lifelong and only intimate and confidential friend never hesitated to say that had poe been left to himself the idea would never have occurred to him of marrying his little child cousin in no transaction of his life was his pitiable weakness more manifest than in this feeble yielding of himself to the dominant will of a mother-in-law had poe remained single or have married another than virginia his regard for her would have continued just what it had been in the beginning and what it remained to the end the affection of a brother or cousin for a sweet and lovable child but no one can believe that poe's nature could have found it satisfying in such a marriage and in fact whatsoever sentimental things he may have written concerning it his whole conduct goes to prove its insincerity 
poe was of all men one who most craved and needed the love and sympathy of a woman of a nature kindred to his own a woman of talent and qualities of mind and heart to appreciate his genius and all that was best in him one who would be to him not only a congenial companion but a helpmeet as well had he married one of mrs osgood's tender sensibilities and feminine charm or mrs whitman with her talent and strong character or even a woman of the practical good sense and judgment of mrs shew who knew so well how to care for him mentally and physically poe would have been a different man but his imprudent and as it has been called unnatural marriage cut him off from what would probably have been the highest happiness of his life with its accompanying worldly and social advantages and bound him down to a life of unceasing toil penury and helplessness it deprived him of a social position and social enjoyment for his poverty-stricken home was never one to which he could invite his friends and he himself seems never to have found in it any real pleasure but to have regarded it merely as a haven of refuge in seasons of distress but as the years went by and despite his incessant toil his life and his home grew more cheerless and poverty-stricken he became hopeless and in a measure reckless it is to be noted that it was only after the death of his wife that he appeared to recover anything like hope or energy then his prospects suddenly brightened in the love of a good and talented woman who could have made his life happy and prosperous when owing to his miserable weakness of will in yielding to temptation for which there was no excuse it was all at once swept from his grasp mr john mackenzie might well have said as he did that poe's marriage was the greatest misfortune of his life and as a millstone around his neck holding him down against every effort to rise but perhaps not even this close friend knew how keenly the poet must have felt the narrowness of his life the sordidness of his home and the humiliation of his poverty patiently and uncomplainingly he bore his unhappy lot and it is to be noted to his credit that howsoever he might at times go astray no word or act of unkindness toward the wife and mother who loved him was ever known to escape from him it will be seen from all that has here been written in the light of prosaic truth that poe's real character was one very different from that which it has pleased the world in general to ascribe to him judging him as it does by the character of his writings as a poet the folly of such judgment and the extent to which it was until recently carried is simply surprising it is true that he appeared to have but one ideal the death of a woman young lovely and beloved and that ideal in the imagining of the world resolved itself into the personality of his wife she they concluded was the original of all the lenores and annabel lees and ulalumes which inspired his melancholy and despairing lyre and in its gloom and hopelessness they could see nothing but the expression of the poet's own nature as well have accused rembrandt of being gloomy and morose because he painted in dark colors like the artist poe loved obscure and sombre ideas and conceptions and he delighted in embodying these in his poems as much as rembrandt did in transferring his own to canvas end of chapter thirty two recording by chufi galeazzi rohnert park california End of the Home Life of Poe by Susan Archer Weiss